Hey everyone, how's it going? Welcome to Know Your Gear Live podcast number 206. You know, it was a lot cooler last week when it was Know Your Gear Live number 205, but now it's six. <laughs> Thank you guys for joining me this week. It's uh, another week has gone by. I hope it was good for you. I had a good week. It uh, seems like it went by fast. That's always nice when it does that. Uh, as always, if you're new to the live podcast every Friday, uh, if you're asking me a question or trying to talk to me directly, put a question mark first at the beginning of your statement or question. That way you know you're directing it towards me. If you're listening to the rebroadcast, I timestamp all of the subjects and, and questions we, we talk about. So you can go right to them. You don't have to listen to the whole show. And uh, if you're listening on iTunes, Spotify, SoundCloud, uh, Pandora, wherever else it is, it's everywhere. It seems like... Uh, Thank you for joining. <laughs> okay, we we already have a bunch of early uh, uh, people who put questions, and I appreciate that. I see a bunch of super chats. I see a bunch of uh, a lot of uh, of regular faces. I should say, can you say faces, names? Your name is your face. <laughs> Technically, your avatar is your face, but I think your I recognize your name. That's maybe that'd be a fun game one time if I could guess the avatars that match the names. But anyways, thank you all for uh, joining. And uh, we have something cool to do. I'm not going to talk about it now. I just want to prep you maybe in 10, 15 minutes or whatever. We're going to talk about I have some giveaways to give, some some things to give away. They're actually pretty cool. I'm very excited. Uh, remember, I did a, uh, a podcast a couple weeks ago or a couple months ago. Uh, we were a tuner. We gave away a Tune Ninja. And uh, and I said, you know, if you're a small company, reach out. These, these companies that we're giving away things from, these are companies with super small budgets, which means like literally no budget in most cases. Is just they can send a few things. Uh, they usually have reverb stores and um, do a shout out for them, give away some of their wares, and uh, talk about them. All right, just something fun. Maybe you'll discover something new. Um, and this one I'm actually uh, really excited about in a w in the strangest way, which we'll get to that. But first, what do we got to do? We got to get to the questions that were early. Uh, some of you guys come super early, like an hour, two hours early and put questions and and I appreciate that. And the first question, which is one ones I always try to do every day is, or every week, is from Scott who says, Phil, what piece of gear has given you seller's remorse after getting rid of it? The good news on that is most of the gear that I have remorse selling, that remorse is short-lived. Over time, uh, I get over it. Now, if I don't get over it, I buy it back. So here's a good example. Uh, behind me right now, there's a Gretsch I'm pointing to right now. It's a black Gretsch. It's on the lower rung of, of the wall. That Gretsch, I've, uh, this is my third time owning this Gretsch, that same model Gretsch. <laughs> so so uh, interestingly enough, if you were to watch uh, early, early years ago on the show, uh, uh, you would see that same Gretsch. You would think that that's the same Gretsch because it's the same model, same color. It's not. That was another one I had that I sold. And uh, I sold the guitar. I uh, regretted it. So I bought another one. The one I bought was they changed the model and I didn't like the changes. And so I sold it. And reflecting back over the years, I thought, you know, I was, I really liked the guitar, even the second one. Why did I do that? And I regretted it. And as the, the guitar fate gods, I don't know what you call them, <laughs> uh, lined up. I found that guitar for sale in, on Reverb at a local shop for less than I sold my other two for, which was shocking because they kept going up in price. So I went and bought it. And um, although that wasn't important, you know, I wasn't like, like trying to make a profit or figure out a scenario like that. That's usually, as you guys know, everybody who's experienced this is not the case. You usually buy a guitar, sell it, buy it again, and you lose money, even more money than what... <laughs> <laughs> you did in the first place. So that's, I didn't make any money on that, on that swap around. I just didn't take the beating I normally take. So to answer your remorse question, a lot of the things I have a lot of remorse for, I purchased back again. My Marshall 2061 head, I've owned three of those. There are a few things. In fact, one of my first videos I think I ever kind of got a lot of you d dialed in was when I said why I'd own like four or five Blues Juniors. I could own 10 by now. I don't know. <laughs> at some point. Um, there's just amps and guitars that you get, and then you go, oh, okay, I'm sick of this, and you get rid of it. Um, so I've learned really not to sell certain things for that reason. Um, what I've kind of learned for me, uh, for and this is kind of goes to remorse thing, and this is the thing I've learned over over time about myself. It's really interesting. It's a, it's like a magical number. I think for me, the magical number is one year. Uh, let, me, let, me, let me explain. 
if you see a guitar behind me on my walls that's not here as a loner for a review or it's not just something you know I'm doing for the channel, let, let, let's say like that that gem that I've been this gem behind me. I have a floral gem. Uh, this guitar I've had for, I want to say four years now. It might be a little longer than that, but four years. I, I'm not getting rid of it. Not anytime soon, because like I said, I figured it out. If a guitar sticks around one year, it's probably staying around for many, many years. It's in that first year. If it's some reason it doesn't, you know, grab me, then it might go. <laughs> so there you go. So to answer your question, uh, remorse, I think I have a few things that I, 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 you know, I wish I didn't sell. I've had this sold and I wish I could have back. Um, but most of the things that I have the most remorse for, I bought back at some point and then just never, you know, never deal with it again. So, um, I also knocked that stuff off a lot because, uh, when I had the store that sell it and buy it again thing was, so when you hear me say sold and bought it, I know a lot of you've done it too, but I used to do it because it was really easy for me to do so. When you have a retail store, it's an easy thing to do. <laughs> you can sell it at top price, you know, used, you know, in your shop and then, you know what I mean? Use that money. And then when you buy it again, it's not as painful without the retail establishment uh, arm, you know, kind of muscle behind me. It, it, these, these buy it or sorry, sell it and buy it again. Experiences are much more painful. So I've backed away from doing those as much for sure. <laughs> for sure. All right. Uh, next question, uh, which is the second question of the day, I believe was Davis. Davis says I'm building a warm guitar and I need potentiometers for my humbucker humbucker setup. Is there a difference between potentiometers used for volume and tone or is the circuit what creates the difference. So yes, uh, all potentiometers are basically the same in the concept of whether they're gonna be a tone pot or a volume pot. Uh, so that's just whether or not gonna add that capacitor, that 0.22 or 0.47 microfarad or whatever you're gonna do, uh, capacitor. So yeah, you're fine there. The main differences are gonna be if you're gonna go with like a logarithmic, a logarithmic or a linear potentiometer. Um, I like logarithmic, log rig, man, logarithmic, sorry. Uh, and uh, most people do too as well. And uh, and then for that uh, particular guitar, I would go 500K potentiometers um, for the most part. You know what I mean? Sometimes I try, I not try, but I do the 500K volume, 250K uh, tone pot. That's a, that's a common one to do, but for the most part, 500Ks, logri logarithmic, logarithmic. I don't know why I'm having trouble with that word today. Logarithmic. <laughs> so... Uh, that's your answer. I hope that helps. And then, uh, then there's types of potentiometers. I like Switchcraft. I like Borns. Um, you know, the CTS pots. I like those as well. Uh, so I just don't, I, I generally don't buy the cheap ones, the cheaper ones. Um, so I don't really find the high end expensive ones are much better. I just find the cheap ones will wear out faster in, in most cases. Uh, the next question came from Mark, who says, hey, Phil, <laughs> this is weird. Okay, hey, Phil, when Kurt Russell uh, gets off the train in Tombstone, the side of the train says 5150. Is there a relationship to EVH 5150? Love your channel. I've learned a lot from you. Um, <laughs> so uh, I, I don't know. Uh, I never noticed that. I'll have to look at that now. What I can tell you in, in, is, is some of you know, because when I did my uh, beer caster video, I worked at Old Tucson. I was I grew up in Tucson. I worked at Old Tucson as a teenager. When that movie was being made, I was a gopher. Uh, if you don't know what a gopher is, I said it in that video, but I'm just re, you know kind of getting the rest of you up to date. A gopher is someone who goes for things like, you know, uh, go get ice, <laughs> go go bring go bring a, a you know a bag of uh, the syrup for the soda machines from like one side of the park to the other. Go do this, go this. And so when I was there, it was it was. Uh, it was pretty awesome. <laughs> they were filming some of the movie. They were finishing up. Uh, and uh, I got to see, I didn't get to see them film because, you know, I had to work and they didn't want, you know, the, the, I was a lackey, you know, I'm just there to work minimum wage, uh, huffing crap from one side of the park to the other. Um, but uh, I did get to see a lot of stuff. One thing that's cool about that scene, uh, so I, I, I'm going to tell you two things. One about the 5150 and too about the train. One thing funny about that scene in that movie is the train tracks of that train are only about double the length of that train, meaning the train being the train is just the main uh, engine. And then the I, I don't know what you call it, the, the car that has the coal, the coal car. Right. So that train is in real life is is a real is a real train or at least it was. <laughs> I don't know because the park's closed now. Um, uh, it's a real train with a real coal uh, car. 
And that's the entirety of that train. And the entirety of the track is not even double that. So in other words, it can only back up and go forward. So if you watch that scene, it's kind of funny. Every time you've seen like a, a tra that train in Old Tucson, especially in that scene, uh, when it's coming to the station, it literally, they can only film it like coming in going, like it just rolls forward <laughs> and it's there. Um, so that's fun to know. The other thing would be, I wouldn't be shocked. It could be luck that it's just called 5150, but back in then, uh, that movie was like 1990. No, 93. That movie was 93. Sorry. Um, in 93, uh, in 93, you know, there's a lot of metalheads <laughs> working at Old Tucson in 93. And so I, I don't know if they could, if it maybe it was a, a fun thing to do like that. I wouldn't be shocked, but I don't know. I, I'd have to look at the train. Like, I don't know if that was prop added to the train or if it's physically, you know, in the steel of that train. Um, but I never noticed it, it said 5150. I just know that scene because I actually got to see part of that scene. And that's how I know the train only rolled forward uh, a few feet. Um, so there you go. What I was paying attention to for the record was Goldie Hawn was in, uh, was wa walking around one day and I got to see her. And, uh, for me at that time in my life, I was like, Whoa, <laughs> it was pretty exciting. It was a, probably the most exciting part. Like, like, wow. Anyways, I was a big fan. Um, okay. Back to guitar stuff. Okay. So we have Josh Smith. Josh Smith said two beers in before the live stream. Going to be a nice Friday night uh yeah i'll have to catch up to you later i appreciate that it's a it's a great way to start the weekend for for a lot of us uh it's it's uh i'm glad <laughs> glad you get to listen to me and, and probably the best way to listen to me is with two beers i'm not advocating that anyone drink i'm just saying it would probably listen make you listen to me much more pleasant um okay the the next one is uh somebody just said how are you i'm fine i don't know why thank you thank you I'm, I'm fine how are you uh, and then um, the next question came from Cars and Guitars. Cars and Guitars is a new patron, so I recognize that, Cars and Guitars. Uh, in fact, I was talking to you, I think, this morning. Was it, my days are blending together about guitar strings. Um, said, good afternoon, Phil. When looking for a good guitar tech, what kind of questions should we be asking to make the right choice? The best thing to do when, it, when talking, uh, trying to find a good guitar tech in your area Definitely try to get references from friends, other guitar players. I know some of us, you know, are are working musicians. I know some of us, have, you know, uh, have friends that are musicians. Some of us are alienated. They, you know, you guys work jobs, and you know, you you probably know one or two other guitar players if you're lucky. That's that's common too. Uh, so I understand it's a little difficult to do that. But in today's and age, sometimes you can find reviews on them. That's a really good to, to figure out how they work. Uh, you know, how good they work with uh, customers and guitars. The other thing is, if you're going to ask them questions, um, look, technical prowess is important, but I'm going to assume in most cases, and this is very generic and very broad stroke, that if they're working at a professional store or a professional repair shop, let's just assume they have some basic skill sets there. So I find it's it's the best thing you can do is talk to them about, uh, ask them to show you things they've done. OK, um, one of my buddies, uh, Tim, uh, who's uh, works at Atomic Guitars, he's one half of the Atomic Guitars in Glendale, Arizona, which is a very, very good shop. I like them. And uh, Tim, I I don't want to take credit for this idea. So I because I don't think I you know, I, I don't think I gave it to him. But I know one of the things years ago was I told Tim he should take pictures of all his work because he does crazy work and put it on, you know, uh, you know, social media, Facebook and stuff. And he does uh, epically. And what's great about that is you get to see his work. You know what I mean? He, he likes to show you befores and afters of pictures and stuff. I find that's really, really good. I used to do that on the old, when we had the McKnight Guitar Company Facebook page, I would put pictures of my before and after work. What I find now is I, I refrain from that a lot from showing work that I do on customers' guitars now because with this YouTube platform, it doesn't go to my customers. It goes to uh, not even, you know, you guys, my community. It goes, you know, epically outside that. And what I find is sometimes customers just don't like, you know, everybody says they have thick skin. That's like the first thing everybody says. <laughs> okay. Um, I, I have moderately thick skin. You know, I've, I've, I've kind of created a tougher skin over the years, especially, you know, being a, a business owner, being on a social media platforms. But uh, that being said, you know, everybody thinks they have thick skin until they read a comment about what a moron they are for owning that type of guitar. So I found my customers don't like the invited 
hell. And and back when I started doing it at the beginning, if you guys remember, I used to show more pictures of my customers' repairs. Um, all my customers would say, "Oh no, I don't mind. I love it." <laughs> and then I started noticing over time, you know, when you when you talk to them later. It wasn't as a pleasant experience. So, but like I said, that's one thing I would do is ask to look at their social media pictures, look at their work before, you know, and just get a talk, talk to them. Because again, it's not like they have to take a test. <laughs> I mean, you might have a test for them, but I don't think you should have a test. I just get a general thing. Uh, the other thing you can do, it's a great piece of advice, cars and guitars, uh, which I, 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 I can't even take credit again for giving this great idea. This is uh, something that was done to me many times by customers uh, for many, many years was they would come in and have me do something basic to one of their guitars. And they would always tell me, and if you do good, I'll bring you more guitars and harder work. And I'd be like, oh, okay. <laughs> and I used to like chuckle. It was not actually as funny when I started, but out over years it was. But what a great way now looking back, what a great way you could do that. Um, you could take, uh, you know, go to your tech if you're concerned about the workload. Look, have them do a basic set. Have it on a guitar maybe you don't absolutely love, right? Uh, especially if you're thinking about having them do something serious to a guitar you're really, really connected to. Maybe take a guitar you're less connected to and have them do something very basic, and then you can you can just check out their work, and that's a very inexpensive way to test the waters would be my other suggestion for you. Um, let's see. Dale Hamilton says, hey, Phil, great channel. Thank you, buddy. Says, I hate to be a broken record, but is there any way you can put your setup sheet somewhere where we can get it? Uh, what about selling it as... What about selling it... I don't understand this. What about selling it was your shirts and mugs? Have a great day. Okay, I understand what he's saying. He's saying, hey, can we get your uh, setup sheets and all that, uh, those PDFs? And what about selling them? I'm not going to sell any of that stuff. And uh, Dale, great question. Thank you for asking it. And it's a little too soon to, to announce this. But since the question came up now, it makes sense. I have purchased a website and we built it. Uh, 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 and it's not up. <laughs> <laughs> that's, a, that's a good way to put it. Um, so in other words, long story short, the good news is the PDFs will be here soon. I just don't know how soon uh, the announcement will be made. I don't know if it's, well, I will tell you this. It's, it will be before next month. What are, we, what are we in April? We're in April. Before May. Before May, there'll be a website, and, uh, and I'll explain what all the website's about and what the website's. And it's not the old website. It's something new, something totally new, something I've been working on on the side. And uh, a little bit connected to me and a little bit not connected to me, but either way, that's where the PDFs and stuff will be and all that stuff. And it will, all that stuff will be free. There'll be free services and then pay, like, pay services on the site stuff, and it'll all come to make sense. Um, so there you go. <laughs> okay. Uh, and so yeah, I don't know. I don't know. And the reason I don't know when the launch date is is because it's all done, but uh, it's being vetted, I think. I'm not sure what the holdup is. So um, back in the day, and maybe it's still that way, Maybe it's because it's a business site. Um, you used to build a site and then it would go up. Uh, now it's, I built it and, uh, you know, because you just built it with a platform. And then um, now it's got to be vetted and all this stuff. So they're verifying addresses and all this stuff. And once all that comes back and it's good, then they, they release it for me. And then I can tell you guys about it. Okay. All right. Okay. Next one is the Magnetic Fisherman who says, hey, Phil, I just bought a PRS SE SSS. Okay, in the bridge is a Seymour Duncan Pearly Gates single coil bridge humbucker. Okay, uh, when you're only bridge, okay, when you're only the bridge, the volume drops a lot. Okay, um, well, it sounds to me like it's not wired correctly. That's what I would assume is going on. So that would be my first assessment of that. Uh, on the Seymour Duncan pickup, uh, you may want to check the, cause here's the deal. It sounds like a, it sounds so easy. It happens to all of us. It happens to me to this day. Uh, you know, you, you think you read the instructions, you're following the wiring colors, and then you go back and look and you see that it's not, uh, wired correctly. So in that particular case, that pickup, especially that pickup, cause it's a mini humbucker. If you have one of the coils only working and it's a single coil mode, it's going to be very, very weak. So, uh, and, uh, cause it's, you know, those coils are not really wound heavy. So that's what I would check is your wiring. I know it sounds basic, but let's start there. That's what I would check. Um, you know, what's sad is I'm at a loss. I can't remember for the life of me off the top of my head, what the Seymour Duncan mini wiring schematic is. The full size humbucker should be black is hot, 
red and white should be tied together. And if you're going to coil split that, you will attach that to whatever your coil splitting switch is. If not, I shrink wrap that off or, you know, just tape that off. And then your green and your bare will be your grounds. And that's straightforward and easy to go, right? Um, it should be the same for the mini humbuckers as well. But please check that, you know, because, you know. I do stuff out of habit, and but sometimes I still, like everybody else, I still look at a schematic right before I wire something out. But that sounds about right. So make sure it's like that. Okay. So that's some of the pre-questions. I know there's a couple more. We'll hit them as we come back. Again, I like to try to jump around and see what's going on. Uh, there's already almost 900 of you hanging out. Let me see what you guys are talking about before I get to some other Super Chats and other stuff going on. Um, Um, Josh Smith says, guys, is log rig rhythmic same as audio taper? You know, this is one of those questions where I don't want to be wrong. So I'm going to tell you what I think. I think they are, as far as I know. <laughs> uh, 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 as far as I know, uh, sometimes uh, Lawrence uh, Petros from LPD Pedals is here, and he's really the expert for that stuff. It's one of those things like I just it's it's terminology thing. Everybody uses different terms for the same thing. Um, in fact, sometimes I I flip. I sometimes I'll say a audio taper, audio taper, or linear, and sometimes I say logarithmic. Logar I don't know why I'm having trouble. That's probably why I say audio taper sometimes. Logarithmic, logarithmic. <laughs> I don't know. Yes, the answer. I'm thinking the answer is yes, but there might be a technical answer that's a little bit different. Okay. Uh, hold on. I'm just looking for uh, anything that's out there that's... Phil Smith. Phil Smith says, slow down. I never slow down, buddy. It's always, it's always going. Okay, hold on. All right, let me hop on while I'm looking for questions. Let me refresh this. And the other thing is, I know I have, hold on, please bear with me, guys, as I also want to look at some subjects that I had penned up to talk about today. Uh, and so let me get to those two, because, like, again, you know, let's do that. Um, the first thing I want to mention, so I have links obviously in the, in the down below, and I put some uh, links to things I wanted to discuss. Uh, the first thing I want to show you is the first link I gave you guys today is it says the best video I've ever seen about speakers. There's a video today. It's a YouTube channel. I, I really apologize for not saying the name of the YouTube channel. I don't want to say it wrong. <laughs> it's a it's a ch good channel. Eighteen thousand subs, and I watched this video and it's him interviewing somebody from Jensen Speakers and. It was a really, really good video. It's 50 minutes, and if you ever have questions about speakers, I don't think you will after this video. So I'm going to suggest that video to you. Just thought I'd tell you about that. Um, and then the other thing is I wanted to also mention uh, there's a, still a link for the uh, Squishy Guitar Project. I'm wearing that shirt today. Look at that. Uh, and I just want to mention that as well. If you're familiar with that, they're doing an auction for some guitars. There's a, some, uh, there's also, you can support that project and learn about that. I wanted to kind of just mention that. I kind of want to mention that at least once every few weeks, uh, because you guys, a lot of you guys like to really just get out there and help and get stuff going and get some excitement out there. And, uh, I'd appreciate it if you'd consider it is basically what I'm trying to say. Um, uh, if you guys know, I've, I've talked about this a lot of times when it comes to charities and stuff. Um, I like, uh, it's a gear channel. I'm always suggesting things that we can buy and things that we can check out for gear. And sometimes, you know, it's nice to say, hey, look, here's some, here's some way to help somebody else's life a little better too. So you have other things, other options to do with your money and your time. Okay, that being said, let's get to some other questions. The next question is going to come from Greg and it says, I wanted to let everyone know what a great Patreon channel you have. He means me. <laughs> Uh, he says, I re recently asked a question. Uh, oh, I recently asked you a parts question, and you not only had the answer, but uh, researched it and shared a link to the exact parts. Thank you. Yeah, Greg, uh, so I, I'm, I'm sure I know what you're talking about. You were talking about uh, he had a question about some locking tuners for a PRS guitar, and, uh, yeah, I sent him a link to the ones I, I do. Thank you, Greg. Uh, you know what's, too, is about that's really cool is the Patreon channel, the Patreon uh I don't know what you call it, not channel, the Patreon thing, my Patreon, uh, 
I finally got it. I talked to Patreon and got something fixed. For forever, it was a nightmare trying to get sort through you guys' question on Patreon. So I think, uh, Greg, what you're experiencing, I think a lot of patrons experience is I'm a lot faster at those answers now because of the way they come into me, which is great. So I want to actually thank you for thanking me for that, but also I want to thank Patreon for fixing that. Okay, thank you. Jack says, I finally bought a Made in Mexico Strat this week. Talking with my guitar, oh, taking my guitar count to 21, no, to two. It's a two and an exclamation point. <laughs> uh, that's different than 21 for sure. I'm gonna, I, it could be 21. Maybe he was like really excited about the one. He's like, I'm gonna put an exclamation point for the one. No, I'm just kidding. He says, taking his count to two. He's got two guitars. So now I need another amp. <laughs> okay. I don't follow the logic yet, but I'm going to go with this. Keep reading. It says, my my little 40-watt Vox is lonely. Here's something for the gas fund. Okay, I understand what you're saying. Two. Jack, I'm assuming... It, look, you got two guitars now. I understand you're going to get another amp. I don't think there's anything wrong with that. But if you buy an amp every time you buy a guitar, you will run out of room. <laughs> so, you know. Um, but all right, that makes sense. I can see that. You know, maybe that's, a, you know, sometimes that's a smarter method. Maybe you should own like three guitars and three amps instead of like some of us that have like 30 guitars and, you know, four amps or two amps and six guitars and one amp. I don't know. Maybe that's the answer. But very excited for you either way. Congratulations on the Made in Mexico Strat as well. Uh, Mr. Fancy Hands. Hey, Mr. Fancy Hands says, hey, Phil, could you explain how stock pickups would improve through the fender lines? Also, uh, who do you think makes the best stock pickups going? So, okay, so in the Fender question, part of this question is uh, how to explain their stock pickups. Well, it's changed. It used to be a, a uh, the, you know, like I said, the Made in Mexico's would have these ceramic-based uh, magnet pickups that were okay. I like them. I, I've always talked about the old uh, Made in Mexico pickups, the uh, the standard series pickups. In fact, um, to this day, I still have a couple of guitars with the standard Mexico-made bridge pickup in there with different neck and middle pickups. And... Um, because it's kind of got like that P90 punch to it with a big ceramic uh, magnet on the back of the pickup. Um, but in the current lineup, you know, now they kind of they kind of made that a lot easier. So now the the player series, which is made in Mexico, essentially, from what it looks like to me, they have the uh, made in USA pickups that we know from the American Standard line. I know this is going to get really convoluted and crazy if I, you know, for for some of you, but just keep to understand that the players. Sorry, the professional series of Stratocasters or, or guitars now are updated from the standard series. So the standard series, American standard series, uh, those pickups are essentially now what's in the player series made in Mexico. So I can understand why you ha are confused. Anyone would be confused by all these pickups and how Fender layers it and what they do with it. Um, but the best way to explain the stock pickups is, is that Fender's always going after an era of sound. So that's the best thing you have to pay attention to. There's basically the 50 sound. Part of the 60 sound is the 50 sound. Then you get the late 60s, 70s sound, right, for Fender. And then after that, I don't know if there's really, in my opinion, an 80 sound Fender pickup. Because then maybe the 80s, later 80s, you're going to get to the lace sound, which is lace and then, of course, noiseless. And after that, that's the way I kind of see that. But the important part for you, the consumer, to pay attention with Fender is Fender's always either going after an era, of a decade of sound, right? So when their guitar is a certain decade, like the 50s sound, right, 60s, or they're going after a style of player. Sometimes we, uh, when we see like Texas specials, a lot of times that's implied to be more like Steve Ray Vaughan because he had like this hotter Texas sound kind of going. That's very general. Some of the really fanatical Fender people like me are going to go, that's not actually correct, but it, it's close enough for the layman to, to understand that. Um, and that's the best way to think of it. Who do I think makes the best stock pickups going? Like in other words, for their own guitars? I would say for me, it would be Gibson, then PRS, then Fender. After that, I don't know a whole lot of companies that make their own pickups for their own guitars. The mainstream companies, big companies. Even Ibanez, you know, mostly are doing DiMaggio's or now Seymour Duncan's. Uh, they don't wind a whole lot of pickups from their premium guitars. Um, I'm trying to think who else. Uh, yeah, you know, really, isn't that sad? G&L does good pickups, but again, you know, I'm going to say, just to, in my opinion, I guess, I'll, and how I'm kind of summing that up for you, uh, Mr. Fancy Hands is, I'm thinking not who makes them best for in the guitars, but who would I buy aftermarket to put in another guitar? I like to buy Gibson pickups and put them on other guitars. 
Then I like uh, PRS pickups. I buy Fender pickups the least to put in, even even Fenders. Um, but not because I don't like them, just because there's so many options out there. But but I still like them. But they would be the least of the three. Jeff says he's got his uh, his Sabo uh, Sabo Kramer guitar. Oh, awesome! He says uh, doing a full setup while watching. By the time I read this, he will be frustrated at intonation and tuning tips for uh, and advice for the detune setup. Well, the great thing about that guitar is the bridge really isn't floating and the detune is a little bit easier to do. The best tip for that is you pull the detune out and uh, unlock the, the nut and tune the detune up, then lock it and then push it in. And then there's a small little adjustment Allen, uh, Allen screw on the side and you'll, you'll fine tune it there. So it's the opposite, but there's usually a great instruction, usually in the little packet they give you with the detuna that kind of walks you through that. But it's, I only tell you that cause it's very intu unintuitive for a lot of players. A lot of people, players want to set the guitar up E to E and then figure out the detuna and you'll find you'll go nuts doing that. Start with D and then go back to E. I hope that makes sense. And by now I hope you don't even need that advice cause you're already done. George's question is, Hey Phil, I'm doing a tele build. I installed a Seth, no, he didn't. He installed a Seymour Duncan Seth Lover in the neck. Any recommendations for a good bridge single coil? Sure, sure. Um, you know what I would like for that for that set? If I was going to do a Seth Lover in the neck, I would put um, a... <laughs> uh, hold on. Why can't I think of it? Quarter pounder. Uh, quarter pounder in the bridge would be great. Quarter pounder is kind of like a P90. It's got that big punchy sound uh, in the sound of it, you know, right? So again, just the sound. Uh, and it would really good do well with that Seth Lover. Because you got to think of the Seth Lover is like a lower output a humbucker. So it's going to be warm in that position. It's not going to be pushing the amp really hard. So if you go with a little bit of hotter bridge pickup, I think they'll blend really well. I wouldn't put any like mini humbuckers in that guitar. That's not the, you know, so for me, the quarter pounder would be my first pick for that guitar. Uh, since it's nice to have, you know, like, uh, brands, you know, Seymour Duncan, Seymour Duncan. The next I would do is the BG 1400, which is the Billy Gibbons custom shop. Noiseless pickup would also match up really good with that because, the Seth Lovers is a pickup that that's kind of got that same like vibe and tone. That would be good for that as well. And then, um, and then of course there's ton of tons of other brands and stuff. I mean, there's tons of stuff out there, but uh, I'm just going with you know what I think would pair nicely with that. I feel like the guy that walks up to your table and be like, "Well, if you're gonna go with the LeBlanc Chalong, I don't know any wines by the way." <laughs> That's why it is made up the LeBlanc Chalong. Anyways, uh, LeBlanc Chalong, uh, I would go with the white cheese. Says it will, you know, I don't know. Yeah, that was a bad joke. All right. <laughs> Felicity says, hey, Phil, just got my first bass. All right. Bass in the house. Uh, I, I use Fender Aerodyne Jazz from Guitar Center, but it's on police hold. Got any police hold stories? <laughs> uh, thank goodness. Uh uh, thanks goodness is Friday. So first, I want to talk about the Aerodyne first. That's a great, fantastic bass. Um, the only downfall of the Aerodyne series for me has always been, if you ever want to just be pissed off for days, Aerodyne's in the U.S. Uh, if the Fender Aerodyne's always come in black, and but if you go, if you go to like in Japan on online, go online and look at Fender Japan's website. <laughs> they have amazing Aerodynes in all kinds of cool colors. They get all, and they get different scales. They get 32-inch scale Aerodynes. They get all kinds of cool stuff. We just get black. But it's still a great bass. So good bass, good choice, smooth move. I like it. Uh, please hold stories. So if you're not familiar with what Felicity's saying is in most places, especially in the United States, uh, there's something called a police hold. And what a police hold is, is you pay for a pawns license. Look, and again, I'm only got, I, I'm, I've only owned a business in Arizona. So most states are like this and different cities are even different. So just I'm explaining my situation, which is going to be consistent with a lot of places. Not all though. Um, what I mean by that is uh, when you take something on trade, you have to have what's called a pawn license, just like a pawn shop. You have to have it. You have to be fingerprinted, just like a pawn shop, for no criminal record. Uh, and then every piece of uh, gear that comes into your store, you have to fill out paperwork and you pay a fee to the city to send the information and have it verified that it's not reported stolen. And you hold it. And when I was doing it, it was 14 days. I believe it's 21 days now where I live. 
I'd have to confirm that. But I think that's what I heard, um, that it got pushed up to 21 days uh, for longer. Uh, so what happens is, and, and so what Guitar Center is doing is the same thing we used to do in, in, my, in my store, which is you would take a piece of gear, and let's say I take in this, I don't know, I don't have a piece of gear here. <laughs> yeah, I do. Okay, let's say you take in this uh, this uh, Blue Amp 1 on trade. Uh, you have to fill out all this information. Like, you have to basically get the customer's driver's license and all that information. You put it on the sheet, and you write the serial numbers down to this, and you send it in for pawn clearance, right? Sometimes also called police hold. The, what happens next, though, is you can sell it. You just can't let it leave the premises. So what happens is, is let's say you put this down like Guitar Center does, like we did, and it will say, you know, available April, you know, or May 15th, right? And so you could buy it, but you can't physically take it out of the store until May 15th. So you can put a deposit on it or you can physically buy it. doesn't matter. We'll put it in the back. And when it clears pawn clearance or police hold, you can come get it. And, of course, if it doesn't clear, uh, clear please hold um you will uh you'll get your money back <laughs> right because you're not getting the product because there's a problem so uh that's what it is for those that are, that are curious what that's all about that's what that's about uh in i my store was 12 almost 13 years i had 12 years in like eight months is how long we kept our business open and in 12 years eight months we never had one issue with pond clearance not one in any way um so that, but uh, yes, <laughs> yes. Do I have, do I have a pawn clearance story? I only have one. <laughs> okay, it, it goes like this. It's uh, it's not even a good story, but I'll just tell it to you. Uh, so this one time, this kid came in. I say kid because he's like twenty. Uh, this kid came in with a Marshall amp. I don't know what kind of Marshall amp it was. I think it was solid state. I just don't remember it was being a very expensive amp. And uh, my wife was working the counter, and I was helping someone. And she had not at that time done a trade yet, right? So, of course, like anyone has a job, you have another employee or a partner working and they haven't done something, you're kind of keeping an ear to see if they have any questions or if they're going to need help. And uh, long story short, the, the kid's like, yeah, I'll, I want to sell this to you. And my wife goes, okay, how much you want? And, uh, you know, he said uh, 400 bucks. And my wife looked it up and... She's like, I don't know. She came up with this because, you know, just like Guitar Center, you look it up, what they're going for. My wife says 200 bucks. Now, I remember thinking in my head when she said that, that was way too low. Like that was low. She was lowballing him too low. But I think she was, again, nervous and she was trying to find the right price to be safe for the business. Right. And so I would I was thinking, like, maybe I'll go over there and say, hey, look, kid, I think we could probably go 325. But I hadn't looked at what she looked at, too. So I was curious. Right. And. All of a sudden, before I can say, even before I could process that she told him like 200 bucks, he goes, okay. <laughs> I'm like, oh, crap. <laughs> right? So, so uh, okay, so now my brain goes to, okay, maybe I should go over there and, you know, because I don't want to take advantage of anybody. Let's go and figure this all out. Make sure everybody's on the same page because I have more experience trading and stuff. And before I could get over there, m the kid was walking out of the store. I didn't catch what happened, but the kid's walking out with the amp. And so I walk over there and, the, and I tell my wife, I said, I said, oh, did, did, did he not like that price? And I, cause I was like, this is a coachable moment, right? I'll tell her like, oh, this is how I kind of verify different prices and give them suggestions for different trade values versus sell values. And she goes, no, no, he was totally happy with 200 bucks. And I said, uh, when, what happened? She goes, oh, I told him I wouldn't buy it. And I said, uh, you wouldn't buy it. And she's like, no, 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 that was too stupid low. I, she goes, I threw that number out cause he looked sketchy and. And uh, the whole situation seems sketchy is what she's saying. And she said, I threw this low number to see what he'd say. And he took it too fast. She says, um, it was probably stolen. <laughs> so I was like, e yeah, <laughs> not, yeah, it's stolen. But yeah, I understand the logic. So, uh, but like I said, what happened was you have to train people for that. My wife became very good at it, as always, uh, a lot, all the other employees too. Um, but yeah, it's, we never had a problem uh, because of the fact that we were really diligent about doing everything. So you have to be, but that's also luck. That's luck. I have friends that own stores and I think they're diligent too. And they've been nailed three or four times. When I say nailed, meaning they got, they got hosed, uh, on that deal. You get the, sometimes the company that takes the trade is the one that's going to take the biggest brow beating financially on that scenario when they take and use goods. Not always, but sometimes we've talked about this before on the podcast about how that all works. Like sometimes you get your product back when it's stolen and sometimes you have to pay the, the store or the pawn shop that take, took it or you have to pay a portion. It's all kinds of scenarios. It depends on your city and state and what's going on. 
So there you go. So yeah, no no cool stories, unfortunately. No f- cool, like interesting stories, because thank goodness uh, that's one of those things you don't want cool, interesting stories about. Okay. Um, <laughs> Disturbing the Peace Music says she was probably right. You know, I, I really felt like, uh, yes. Yeah. I will tell you. Okay. So I'll tell you a story that is funnier. Here's why. I, last week I told a story about the guitars that got knocked off the wall. I let my wife watch that. I, I actually made, not made her, but I begged her to watch the podcast for that piece and watch it because I wanted to see that, you know, what I said, to see if that was accurate the way I remember it was accurate. She, it was. It was good. And then my wife said to me, I thought you were going to tell the story about the strings. So this isn't a Pond Clarence story, but this is a funny story about strings, and I'm going to share that story with you before we get some questions. I think you'll enjoy it because it's the craziest thing I think has ever, ever, ever happened, happened to me. One day I was working in the store helping some customers. We had an employee helping a couple of customers, and my wife was working the counter, and a man walked in. I saw the man get out of a car. Like a woman pulled up. She's in the car driving. He got out of the car and walked in the store. The store was glass, so you get to see people when they come up. So he, you know, she, she didn't, they didn't park is what I'm trying to get at. To pull up, he comes out, he comes in the store. Now, here's what happens. He comes in the store, and he's loud. Like, he's loud. He's like, hey, everybody, go Wildcats, right? Uh, I don't think it was Wildcats. I don't know what the ASU team is. I'm from t- Tucson. <laughs> Originally, I-, I told you guys I don't listen to sports. Whatever it is, it's ASU's team. Oh, uh, uh, Sun Devils. I apologize, Sun Devils fans. So he's like, go Sun Devils. He's like, we're going to win. Weird thing to have a dude kind of just scream in your store, in a music store, right? And so he walks up. He goes like beelines for me. And he's like, hey, how's it going? I go, good. And he goes, he goes, you like basketball? And I said, nope. <laughs> I, said, I said, I like guitars and music. And he goes, that's okay. He's like, we're going to win. I'm a coach. I'm the coach and we're going to win. And I said, cool. And then the customers, the two customers talked to me. He goes, he goes, do you like basketball? I don't remember what they said. Probably like, yeah. And he's like, yeah, because we're going to win. He says, he says, he says, uh, I don't know how, how, what he said. Okay. But this is what he does. He looks at the counter and there's my wife. And he says, um, are you the boss to me? Right. He said, are you the boss? And I said, oh no, I'm not the boss. And he goes, who's the boss? Is she the boss? And I said, yeah, I was, you know, cause what are you going to say? It's your wife, right? Yeah, of course. <laughs> and I said, yeah. And he goes, and he goes, he yells across again, the store to my wife, Hey, you're the boss. And she looks up and he goes, he goes, this guy knows who's the boss. Right. And then my wife's like, okay. And then he walks away. You're not thinking anything weird, right? So then he goes over to the accessory section and he gets a set of bass strings. And he goes to the counter. Now, then he leaves. <laughs> and I'm thinking, cool, some guy who's a coach at ASU and loves basketball and playing bass. What else could you what else could you want? So I go to the counter to ring the customers up that I have because I've been helping them. And when I'm ringing the customers up, I look down and there's a pack of bass strings on the counter. And I'm like, that's weird. So they ring up the customers, they leave. So my wife, I don't know where, she's walking from somewhere. And I said, hey, what are these bass strings here? And she goes, oh, that guy returned those strings. He said you said it was okay. I said, he didn't return them. He he was buying them. And she goes, no, he said... He bought them and that it's been, he doesn't have a receipt, but he said when you were, he was standing over talking to you, you said I would take care of him because I'm the boss. So I gave him 32, 60, whatever, five, and she paid him on cash and he left. This is what's funny about that story. You know how sometimes when I tell you stories like that and I go, now it's funny? No, it was funny right then. <laughs> I'm not going to lie. That was the coolest way to ever be robbed ever. We were so impressed with how that guy orchestrated that and how how cool that was. I'm not making that up. Some of you guys are going to probably have opinions both directions. Some laugh. Some are going to say it's horrible. But it was so crazy that he figured out how to do all those things. And it was seamless. Like I, the time I just told the story is almost the time it actually happened. It was fast. So he got 30 bucks <laughs> and he left. So, um, that was so yeah. And my wife always thinks about that story because she always thinks about the guy who got the refund for the bass strings and was a coach at ASU. All right. 
Yeah, somebody says, what a creep. Yeah, of course, of course, right? But hey, you know what? I'd rather have that happen than if he just put him in his pants and walked out the store. Either way, he was going to steal it. But at least now, that was it was funny. It was funny that night when we went home. We we're like, that was the craziest thing ever. And, and it's also a nice reminder to people to remember that people will go to great lengths for $30. I mean, that, you know what I mean? <laughs> so, all right. Um, okay, so there, yes. Uh, Yes. Yeah. Okay. I'm reading. I'm just reading some of the comments. I agree with some of you. Some of you guys are uh, okay. So let's get to questions. Go back to the subjects of guitars. Uh, so the subject uh, next subject comes from Griselda. Griselda says, "When checking that a nut is cut correctly, what are you looking for?" Oh, great question. Uh, what is the negative of a poorly cut nut? Nut. Okay. Is it normal to need a new nut? with a drastic change in the string gauge. Cheers. Sure. Let's keep it very basic because again, this isn't a visual uh, platform, right? Because I can't I can't show you with visual aids. Um, when when you're looking for a nut that's cut correctly, what you're really looking for is two things. You're looking to make sure that the nut is the the, the strings are cut into the grooves of the nut first. We're, we're not even talking about tuning stability. That comes later. We're talking about we're looking at make sure that the strings are cut low enough to where they are not buzzing, because that's the thing. If their slots in the nut are cut too low and the strings are buzzing, well, then you have a problem. You have to either put a new nut on or you have to use like baking soda and super glue or something and build the nut up, depending on the material. Um, and, uh, and then the next thing you have to check is if they are not buzzing, now you want to make sure that they're, this, that means they're not, you know, if they're buzzing, they're cut too low. If they're not buzzing, you want to make sure that they're cut low enough. Uh, and there's a couple ways to you can use a string action gauge. Uh, you can use another guitar string to check that out. I use fret wire, as you know, as, as some of you guys know, watch my reviews. I have different gauges of fret wire uh, that I use that are radius and I can put them behind the nut just like a zero fret. And I check that way. It works really good for me. Um, but that's the main thing. Now, to to since this is probably more of the, the important part of this question, which is what is the negative parts if it is cut poorly? Well, believe it or not, there's Obviously, if it's not cut low enough, you can have intonation problems because you have to push so far, the, the, the string goes sharp on that note. That That's to the extreme, okay? Like a vandal. Anyways, uh... <laughs> Anyways, no, I'm just kidding. Uh, anyways, uh, that's the extreme. It'll go, it'll go sharp and uh, have intonation issues. But realistically, at the very minimum, it's going to be very difficult to pull off certain chords and certain things add in the first, second, and third frets, believe it or not. So it's important that a nut is cut correctly. And here's why I think so. Not only that the nut is cut uh, correctly and smooth, so again, tuning stability, the strings move across the nut perfectly, no binding, no issues. But also, what I find is a lot of times when players say this guitar plays, is great they're really talking about those first chord positions by the, the you know third second first fret like the f chord where you have to bard off that's a nightmare for some players if the nut's not correct cut correctly and if it's cut really well and it's a perfect guitar and it's set up really nice the barred f chord really is not as bad as some players have problems with when they start you know start playing guitar you know what i mean um most players uh, on average, are going to have the biggest problem with barred type chords. Using that finger to press down all the strings evenly is a little tricky for players at the beginning. And so a good setup will really help that process. I mean, look, it's it's still got to be on you. You got to still put in the time to do it. Um, you know, we talk about this also when it comes to gear. Gear can't make you do anything. It can help you do the things you can do already. Does it make sense? Or it can make things better for you, but it can't. It can't do it for you. you still got to put in the time. But it, it's, it makes a difference. So that's the main r things you want to do when uh, cutting a nut. So here's the thing that I don't like, and this is and this is a side little tangent I want to go on. The nut is such a cheap piece of the guitar. <laughs> even even bone nut is cheap. Bone is cheap. Graph tech parts are cheap. Go look at a graph tech uh, pre cut nut. It's nothing. Manufacturers. Are no manufacturers are consistent. What I mean by that is all manufacturers are consistent in what they do. There's a process in which all of them kind of follow. That's the whole point of manufacturing, right? So they make product as cheap as they can, as good as they can for the the price they want to make it for. I don't care if it's a toaster or if it's a guitar. That's everybody's goal. How good can we make this, and how cheap can we make it? Good. Right, and everybody's level of good is different. Everybody's level of jeeps different, but that's really the goal. 
the the thing that sucks though is how they achieve that in most cases is by focusing on things that consumers focus on and not focusing on things that consumers don't. So I don't want to get this too convoluted for you. So let's keep it very basic. When people talk about like, I want to say like an inexpensive guitar, right? We're talking about a hundred dollar guitar, $200, $200 guitar. And they go, it's fantastic. I watch reviews all the time. Look, I'm not, you know, you watch my reviews. I watch other people's reviews. We all watch reviews. Some reviews are very tricky for me to watch because I watch and it's if you focus on the wrong things, which I have been guilty over the years doing certain things too. You know what I mean? Uh, you're just, you know, you focus on the wrong things. And I've learned to refine what I talk about in my videos. A reviewer go, man, look at the finish on this guitar for 200 bucks. It's so pretty. That's great. The nut looks like ass and it, <laughs> right? And all the important parts of the guitar are not done right because that's not where your focus is. So to me, there are some bare minimums. And that's why if you notice in the last, this year, especially more than every year before, but I've always been pretty, I think, diligent when it comes to this stuff, but more diligent this year than ever before in the videos, we're going to focus on how good the frets are done. How good is the nut done? You know why? Because that's not stuff that's physically cost. It's labor. It takes time to make the frets right. It takes time to make the nut right. And those things are the things that they want to pass over. And those things are the things that, yeah, you can have fixed or fix yourself, but you don't want to do that. You know, <laughs> if you don't have to, you don't want to do, right? Uh, no one wants to. I, want, I always, I, I've said this to my, in fact, I just saw L, uh, Lawrence just post something. What do he said? Uh, Oh, he sent it to me. He said, Philip, I sent a care package out to you. It should be here tomorrow. Ah, oh, I'm excited for that. Thank you, Lawrence. Um, uh, but I was actually going to use Lawrence as a perfect example. Um, I got sidetracked with his reading his comment. I was going to say, I've told Lawrence this, right? Um, I, I, this is how I feel about me personally, my guitars. When I buy a guitar for me, it has nothing to do with YouTube, YouTube videos. I'm not talking about reviews. I'm talking about me, Philip McKnight, the person buying a guitar. I want to buy a guitar. I don't want to buy a project, right? That's 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 me personally. As a repair person, projects are fun. As a YouTuber, they're amazingly fun. They fun content. I can show you things. I enjoy them. But when I'm not making YouTube videos about fixing guitars, I'm not like fixing my own guitars. <laughs> not anymore. Those days are gone. I did that before I got paid to do it. Because now, like a lot of people, and not, and not everybody's like this. Like I have friends who are mechanics and when they work on guitars all day, or cars, I'm sorry, all day, they go home and work on their car. But I have friends who are mechanics that are like, last thing they want to do is work on their car after they work on people's cars all day because that feels like work. Because So um, my point to this is I'm not really looking for a project. So although I understand and I say it all the time in videos that, you know, these guitars need some 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 products, you know, some some are, these products need some work, it's not really like what I want to see. I want to see guitars come out great. So that's why the nut is a big deal. And that's why I want to tangent right now. I think that's a thing that we should be focusing more, especially as a guitar community, because if we focus on it more, they'll be forced to fix it. And that's really where the power of this YouTube arena is, sh is showing us, is that if we as a community of reviewers, uh, and I mean all of us. I don't care if you got five subscribers. You're in the community. If you're making content, your your content is available to manufacturers and to other consumers. You're affecting choices. If we set standards that say, "Hey, make good products," they'll be forced to make good products. If we say, "Oh, it's crappy, but it's one hundred and eighty nine dollars," so let's just you know, who cares? What do you think the manufacturer sees when they see that? Oh, okay. Well, why make it better? They're happy with it. We shouldn't be happy with it. I'm not saying we should be mad. I'm not talking about stark raving, screaming about crap. I'm talking about making points that make sense like, hey, you know, these are the things that you sh we should address. Again, not not to pun punish anyone, not to, uh, uh, you know, just to let the companies know that we want quality. And if they make quality, we're excited about it. And that's really what it comes down to. If you're excited about it, you'll buy it. If you buy it, it's good for everybody. The economy, them, <laughs> right? So... Uh, that's why we're focusing more on that. So that's why I basically want to say I love that question because I think that's one of the things that we need to focus more on is how the nut is cut, which is the next couple reviews you see of guitars. I even, I've upped, upped it even more since the last ones you'll see. You'll see we're focusing even more on exactly not just saying when a nut is right and wrong, which is what I've been showing you in the last few videos. videos. We're going to go more into detail about when it's right, why is it right, and when it's wrong, why is it wrong. And uh and hopefully turn the reviews not so much into just a, hey, if you're looking at buying this guitar, it's a good review, but also teaching you guys exactly 
what to look for when you're looking at guitars to tell if it's a good quality, if the manufacturer is doing right by you, because it's important. All right. Uh, hold on. Okay, Aaron Short Music, which is a good channel, by the way. Please check him out. Um, he says, should action be mentioned in a guitar... Oh, man, why did you jump? Okay, it says, should action be mentioned in a guitar review unless it's really off? It's such a personal preference. Well, it depends on the channel, okay? So, so Aaron, I have this... Uh, this is where I'm going with my channel, is this. I think everyone should lean into their assets. If you're Pete Thorne, you know, play Amazing. <laughs> right because that demonstrates to the end user how good can this guitar sound right um you know sean tubbs same thing i'm just using those as a good examples aaron you know uh, just just you know i go and watch uh you know sean tubbs and i'm like okay that's how the guitar can sound if i knew what the hell i was doing with it great <laughs> okay that's good because that that tells you something right you know um, and then I go and watch another channel and maybe they'll talk about something else. Maybe the desirability factor of it, you know, why they wanted it, why they don't like uh, want it and stuff like that. And every channel should have a vantage point that's unique. Okay. That's what I think. And so in my channel, what I want to start focusing more on is the tech side of it, looking at what makes the guitars good and bad, because I don't want to necessarily not to do anything else. I want to be one of the videos you watch when you're looking at a product review to go, okay, you know, this is how it sounds when it's right. This is why someone who, you know, is in this scenario might like it. Here's Phil looking at some of the issues with it or things that are good about it that I will be, so I'm prepared for the purchase when I make it. When I, I like the example, I, I, video I've been using for example lately is that I've been as RG565 video, a thousand bucks, great guitar. I love the guitar. I'm very happy with it. And I, I found exactly what I wanted to happen to happen that video. A few viewers have bought it. They physically bought it. I know for a fact because they sent me pictures with it and they love it. And they said, yep, I had a couple issues with it. And it was really pleasing because those issues were the ones you pointed out. I knew it was coming <laughs> and I'm okay with it. I, I, I figure for the price for the guitar, because look, it's a thousand dollar main Japan guitar. Thousand dollars is a lot of money, but not for a main Japan guitar with those kind of features. It wasn't so far out of whack. So, but now knowing you know, what the possible issues are. So back to your question, should uh, the action be mentioned? It's up to each channel to discuss, you know what I mean, what it is that's important to them. I want to go through every setup of a guitar um, because, not because it's it means if that one guitar is set up badly or well, all of them are, it brings up conversations that make, uh, make, it, make the end user happy that they go, okay, um, my question is happy, informed that, this is what I'm looking for. And when I see it like this, it's right. When I see it like this, it's wrong. That helps. And also it takes my opinion out of the equation more, which is really what I'm after. I don't want to give an opinion about a product. I don't think I have to. I mean, whether I like it or not is relevant. That's opinion. But I mean, what I'm saying is I don't want to say a product's good or bad. I want to get, I want to test it. And then at the end, it did well in these categories and it did bad in these categories. And then you figure out what was important to you. I hope that makes sense. Uh, Sean Brooks says every PRS I buy has high action, even the three thousand thirty nine thousand thirty nine thousand thirty nine hundred dollar custom twenty four. Yeah, I agree. Yeah, I, I, I and, and again, here's a perfect example in my uh, in my PRS review. I talked about their action, and I've talked about in the past why I think the action is a little high. I always think it's a little high. It's not crazy. I mean, you could get crazy high action. I haven't seen every PRS, obviously, but. And the ones I've experienced, they're a little high. And I think personally that they make it a little high because that really backs the statement of the guitar can come out of the box and play. Remember making the action. Look, if the action is a little high, uh, you have to uh, here. Give me an example. If I buy a guitar like a PRS and the pull out of the box and the action is a little high, I could take it to a gig and it's going to be a little bit more work for me. I'm going to have to put in a little bit more, you know, hand strength. I'm going to have to squeeze a little harder. I'm going to have to do a little bit. I have to play a little, a little harder. And I probably won't be able to pull off everything effortlessly, but at least it's playable. If I pull out the guitar and it's buzzing and it's got dead notes and there's all kinds of problems, that stuff literally kills it. You know, when you go to play a, <laughs> your solo and you hit the note and it goes tink. <laughs> <laughs> you're dead, you know, you're dead in the water. There's no fix for that. So I think it's by strategy that PRS puts the action just a little high. And 
and and that's and that's what's interesting about me lately measuring all the guitars that have been coming in is because what I'm noticing, uh, even though I should have noticed it years before, what I noticed in no time at all is that most manufacturers are setting up their guitars for this sweet spot that isn't great, but it's just not bad. They're looking for that middle ground. And if that's good for you, you've got a guitar out of the box, great to go. And if it's not good for you, I will show you how I make the adjustments and then you can decide if that matters to you. Okay. And then Johnny Love, great, great comment, says, as long as the guitar is built well, the action can always be altered. Of course, of course. The setup is the easiest part of the guitar. Easiest meaning uh, least painful. Okay, so let's go to the next question, which is uh, Ben. Ben says, I got a set of Seymour Duncan JB59 in a broken SG, okay? Looking for a backup HH guitar to drop them in. New or used, 250 bucks or less. Best value in your opinion? Uh, well, right now in this market, it's hard for me to throw out an answer like that. I can't go like, oh, yeah, definitely buy one of these um, to put it in. Used is definitely, look, here's where I think you've got a, a great opportunity right now. If you had if you had 250 bucks and you have great set of pickups to put a guitar into, I wouldn't put any parameters on you at all. Like, here's my suggestion. Don't, don't even worry about that. Just go, I've got, if you have the option to go to stores, go to stores, okay? Because that's just going to be great. You pick up some guitars, only by price point, right? Find a great one. Don't even worry about what it is. Don't go in with it like, I'm going to buy a Strat or I'm going to buy this. or I'm gonna, Don't worry about what you, what you buy. Just pick up something. And once you love it, and it weighs a place, you got pickups to put in it, it hits your budget. It's a perfect win for everybody. So if you can't go to stores, you can go online, go on, you know, reverb, guitarcenter.com, whatever, eBay, whatever your preference is for used gear. And same thing, just sort through that price point. All of them let you filter by price point, filter the price point, and then go through. But what I would do, since you already know you have a good set of pickups to put in the guitar, just look for a good guitar. Look for that opportunity, a good guitar. You know what I mean? Um, you know, something that's a quality piece of instrument that's at, you know, that you know you, you can sell it off if you want to get your 250 back. That's nice. That's what I would suggest is not actually putting too many parameters on yourself since you are, since you have two things that go in for you, which is the price you have already locked in what you need and the pickups. That's what I would do if I was in your situation right now. So, so I, honest to goodness, if you told me, if Ben, if you said, Hey, Phil, I'm mailing you, don't do it. <laughs> there used to be a time on this channel where I could just say stuff, but now stuff shows up in the mail when I say stuff. So it's going to be scary. Uh, I, but Ben, if you said, Hey, I'm sending you 250 bucks and two uh, Seymour Duncan pickups to make a video with it and see what you do. I literally, that's the video I would make. I would literally go on reverb.com, put in filters for between 200 and $250. Well, it depends if you're 250 lock, you know, you got to factor in uh, sales tax, but I'd also try to do offers and then I would filter and I wouldn't even care brand, any of that stuff. I'd just be looking for a cool guitar at a great deal to put these pickups in that I go, Oh, that'd be great. And so many times when you do that, you're like really cool. I, I a good example tied into this is I bought a guitar yesterday. I had no intention to buy a guitar yesterday. I bought this Joe Saturani right there. That's a real, real one. Uh, made in Japan. It's the is that pearl gray? It's, it's, gray. it's not black. It's it's got, I say gunmetal gray, but I don't, it's great co color. I bought it from Zim's Guitars in Mesa, Arizona. Uh, uh, personally, because he's, you know, anyways, uh, he's a friend of mine. So what happened was I went in there and I went to just say hi because I need to get 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 out and out in the world. <laughs> So I went and picked up some shipments. I uh, had to ship out a guitar for, for a viewer and stuff and did some stuff. And uh, long story short, um, I did some trading and we traded some stuff. And, and, and that's the point. I wasn't looking for a guitar at all, but a great opportunity presented itself. And I was in that same situation. I had, I had some money and I had some gear and that worked out. So, and uh, I'm really impressed. I've been really excited about it. It's not, like I said, it's not a, not a guitar that I was like, I need this. It's on my radar. But I, I feel really good about the the purchase, and it's actually probably better than I've felt about any purchase in the last year, um, because of the fact that it wasn't like, oh, I want this, and how do I get it for the price I want to pay, and how do I get it the color I want, and how do I get all this stuff? That literally, like, I just picked it up, played it, and went, man, this is great. <laughs> I like this, and everything just locked up. Price was great, situation was great, trade was great. Came home, felt, felt amazing, and played it all last night. <laughs> and then played it up until about one minute before the show started. 
Uh, John's question is, thanks, Phil. That's not a question. He's just thinking me. No, he says, Phil, thanks so much for all your tips on upgrading my PRS SE guitars. How would you recommend coil splitting 5815s, pickups that are in his hollow body two piezo? It's a 408 style. Oh, so he's asking me, would I go 408 style mini toggles or push pulls, dual push pulls? Okay, so that guitar is a bear of a, a guitar to work on. Uh, no, you know what? No, it's not because uh, what's great is PRS put that, uh, it's like a one and a half inch by like four inch uh, plate on the bottom where the input jacks and the battery go, uh, or output jacks, I'm sorry, and the battery go. Uh, so you can pull that out. Um, I, I think it might actually be easier for you to put the mini toggles in because they might be right there and you could just drill those out, pop them in, and then literally pull those two mini toggles through. Um, if it was me, just for the record, because again, that's what I'm telling you to do, mini toggles. If it was me, I'd put one mini toggle and I'd only attach my neck pickup to it because I don't coil split my bridge. Um, if a bridge, if a guitar I buy has a coil split bridge, I don't remove it for the most part. I mean, I did on one guitar, but I don't, you know, on my other guitars. But if I'm installing coil splits, I only put on the neck because that's the one I'm going to coil split anyways. Uh, so, but either way, I would do mini. Uh, on that guitar, I bet you the mini is going to be easier to install than the push pulls. Just thinking about how you got to get in there because it's really, when you work in hollow body guitars, man, it's, it's closed spaces. It's really tight. So, but it can be done. But that's the way I would do it. Plus it'll look cool. And it's something PRS does. Really cool. Uh, Aeon, Aeon 135 did a super chat. Thank you. I appreciate that. Litve, what's up, Litve? He says, uh, talk me, <laughs> wait, what? Talk me out of a, for oh, so hold on. Talk me out of a Fernandez sustainer, sustainer. So what he's talking about is he's uh, looking at the Ed O'Brien Fender Strat and into a Sustainiac guitar. Um, oh, he's saying he wants me to do a Ed O'Brien equipped guitar compared to a, a sustainer guitar comparison would be nice. Talk me out of it, huh? Um, I, I don't know how to talk. Remember, that's not the rule on the channel. The rule on the channel is you should buy it. I have not tried the Ed O'Brien uh, Fender. I, after playing the sustain the, the sustainer Sustainiac in that Schechter guitar video I did, I would really like to have a sustainer in a Telecaster. I don't know why, because uh, most sustainer uh, pickups are in tremolo based guitars, but I really would really like to have one in a Tele. I have no plans to do that, but I, that's what I would like. It'd be really cool. Um, but they are cool. They are fun. Uh, a lot of the uh, comments on that video were interesting. One of my favorite comments was somebody's like, yeah, I do that. I just by standing in front of my amp. What's funny about that is, you know, I edited out a piece of that video. And now when, you know, sometimes when I do that, when I edit out a piece and I change things, you know, in the video for flow purposes, sometimes I'm happy with it. In that video, I was mostly happy with it. But that one piece I took out, I wish I would have left in there, which I talked about the fact that I, when I said in the video that I noticed that Sinister Gates and Joe Saturani and Steve I and, you know, all these guitar players, uh, Phil Collin, all these guitar players are using them. I, I also wanted to say that I've noticed that they're all using them more and more now that they don't play big amps on stages. They use like some kind of uh, in-ear monitor system. So it's like, it, that's how it feels to me. Yeah, exactly. If I took my Marshall and cranked it on 10, I don't think I need a Sustainiac. I, I, they do have a, a tone to them, but I mean, I feel like I could kind of achieve that. That's what I liked about it. I felt, um, I felt, I felt amazing. I felt like the guitar was alive in your hands, like it was, like it is, like it was. I should say, like it is on stage. It felt great. I enjoyed it so much. What I will tell you is, everyone, and this goes for Litvay too. I don't think everybody should buy a Sustainiac, but everybody needs to apply one. Need, need, they definitely need to play one for sure. You need to play one. <laughs> Everybody, try one. If you get a chance, play one. I've played a couple, but I think now when you play them, it reminds you of how it used to feel when you used to crank your amps. And I just don't crank amps anymore. Not like I used to, and I'm not going to ever again because, you know, I don't have tendonitis, uh, tinnitus, sorry, tendonitis. I don't have tinnitus, and I don't want tinnitus, and I'm not going to do anything to ever do that. So I wear earplugs, and here's what I really do. I, I wear earplugs as soon as the amps get any anything close to being loud, and uh, if I'm even getting that loud, I don't want to be, I don't want to wear earplugs, so I just don't turn up. So I keep amps pretty quiet. So um, I didn't realize how quiet I keep amps. My, Because my family always tells me how loud I am. I didn't realize how quiet I keep amps until I hung out with some friends like the Tone King, by the way. 
The Tone King is psychotic when it comes to playing amps. Every time he plugs in an amp, it's the loudest thing I've ever heard. Like, he will just go for it. Even in a music store, he just, it's 10. He knows 10. He's like 10. I love it because it's so rock star, you know, just to go crank to 10. And there's a couple other friends of mine that just do the same thing. They crank to 10 immediately, but uh, my, I'm not doing it. So, uh, okay. So, Kid Gonzo, <laughs> I don't know, Violent Pixie, whatever. That's a lot. And Violent Pixie. Okay. Uh, cool name. <laughs> this is, hey, Phil, I got a glary thin line changing the bridge to a Goto modern style but the holes don't line up. Yeah, none of the glary stuff is is specced correctly. That's because, uh, you know, they didn't, you know, they're just making cheap stuff. Uh, it says, uh, so uh, would it be better to dowel the holes or redrill and route out the pickup cavity? Well, you're, you're, here's where you're forced by. I can't answer that question because you're forced by how the bridge lines up. The bridge has to line up on the neck. It just has to. So... So if you you have to choose the the proper the proper way, in other words, the proper being the best way for the bridge to line up for the the on the neck and the intonation. So uh, I would do whichever one works, if that helps. Um, the glary where I turn the the glary into you know the the nicer guitar and all stuff. I, I I think I showed all in the video. I had to redo everything. That's why actually, if you guys, you know what's funny is I think I said it in the video, but that's why if you notice when I took the back plate off, I went with furls and I went with individual four furls and did the neck. It's because no back plates, aftermarket back plates fit that. The glary pl back plate was his own nightmare. So I just worked past the problems. If you're working on glary guitars, which is why I recommend buying them in the first place, like I said over and over again in those videos, I always say if you're if you're a potential hobbyist repair person, if you're a repair person and, and you want to do repair, uh, if you want to just do you know work on guitars, if you're looking for projects, you know these are really inexpensive, fun ways to get into that stuff. Uh, and the nightmares they present are fun because that's what you're you know you're there for. You're fix the problem. Every glary I've worked on has been. Uh, hellaciously fun afternoon of just what the hell were they thinking? And I think I, even in my video, did you see, notice I had a router like the, I had to route the the bridge because like their bridge, not not the thickness, the width. It was the craziest thing I've never had to do that before. And, and every time I worked on any kind of glary, every glary I worked on has had some kind of weird quirky where like they're just making up their own stuff. <laughs> but that's why the guitar is seventy five bucks. Uh, the Apple Masher, Apple's Masher says, why is the Mira your most play guitar? What do you think about the S2? So I have one S2, which is my semi-hollow single cut. I like the S2 series, uh, very much so. Um, the S2 series, I think, is the one, it's one of the best deals out there on the market, in my opinion. Uh, it's quality. I like them. I like the way they... I like everything about them. I, even when people complain, some people say they don't like the pickups, they don't like this, they don't like that. I like everything about them. My S2 Semi Hollow is unmodified in any way, and I have no intention to ever modify it. So I like the S2 series. Um, that's easy. <laughs> so that's the easy part. So I like them. Uh, I like them. I own one. I like it. Uh, Mira, why is it my most played guitar? Uh, well, the Mira... It's not about the Mira model, and this is something that keeps coming up, is, you know, people are like, oh, why do you like the Mira? It's not the Mira. I like my Mira. <laughs> I like, is it here? Nope, I took it in the other room. Uh, I don't know what it is. It sounds and plays great. It's... It's it's just a it's just a beautiful beast of a guitar. It sounds great. There's something about it that just works for me. Uh, it, it action is just fantastic. The setup on it is just amazing. Uh, everything about it just perfect. In fact, it's the it's the staple I would put all my guitars to, or standard I should say, not staple. It's everything I want all my guitars to feel like, sound like, and be like. However, uh, if the your next question really should be Phil. Why don't you have like six Miras? <laughs> it's because all the Miras I've played, I like. I like them. There's something about that guitar I like. I like the shape. I like the way it feels. I like it. But I like my Mira the most, the one. And I lean towards it. In fact, uh, a buddy of mine sold me that Mira, the Maple Cap one. I really liked it. And then he asked if I would sell it back to him. Because, uh, you know, that's what happens sometimes, you know, right? Like, right, what we talked about at the beginning of the show. He, he regretted it. He wanted the guitar back. So I sold it to him for what, you know, I bought it for him from him for. And, uh, and, uh, I love that guitar. And, uh, honestly, 
I would love to keep it. However, when he asked me, uh, I could have responded with, oh man, I really like it, you know, because I wasn't in the, you know, I wasn't in the market to sell it. But to be honest, I was like, yeah, I always play the one anyways. I play my Mira. It's just that one. So I don't know. And that's what it really comes down to. It's not Mira. It's not PRS. I want to be very clear. It's not, I don't love that guitar because it's Mira. I don't love it because it's PRS. I don't like it for any reason. I just, in fact, if you were to ask me, if you would have showed me that guitar, and this is no exaggeration, I, I would say 20 years ago because that's safe, but you could have been, you know, I don't know. Yeah, 20. If you would have showed me a picture of that guitar 20 years ago and say, Phil, this will be your favorite guitar, I'd be like, that ugly hunk of crap, I hate it the way it looks. Um, I still don't like the way it looks. It's so boring. My, if you've seen it in the videos, it's just a piece of mahogany, no finish on it. Mine's beat to hell because I play it and I take it everywhere. It's got chips and dings in it and it's it's lacquer finish. It's got a, just a pick guard on it. <laughs> like it's nothing like I don't want to say ugly because that's like insulting anybody that has one too. It's just it's not a it's not a you know, it's not an exciting looking guitar. It's not the guitar I thought I would like. So it just is. And I play it. Um I play the guitar Nathan made for me because really Nathan cheated. He he really was smart when he when he got that guitar for me and did that, he really specked out. He played my Mira. He knows that guitar, that Mira. So, I mean, he really, it is the closest thing to that guitar and the way it feels and plays. So I play that one a lot. In fact, I play that one more now than the Mira. All right. Uh, Tampa Blues says, what humbucker pickups would you suggest for an ES-335 type guitar? Ibanez AS-73 for blues, looking under $300 for two pickups, two humbuckers. So this is where another problem, disadvantage. So let me give you the Tampa Blues. Let me give you the disclaimer. I am not paying attention to the pickup market enough to know what the heck the pickup prices are going for. So what I mean by that is I don't have it here, but I just bought a relic i guess it's called relic i don't know what it's called it's it's the nickel plated but it looks like it's aged uh dimarzio uh tone zone i just bought one of those and it was i want to say it was 102 and then shipping i think i paid 109 for it and i was in shock <laughs> <laughs> it was like, it was like a moment where, you, you know, a lot of us have had lately with the inflation lately where you go to a restaurant and you're like 325 for a coke the hell right like literally i had that moment i had that you know back in my day you could be a pickup for 69.95 like i literally felt that way so you know uh so i had a little shock so 100 bucks for a demarzio pickup was um a little a little shocking and by the way i couldn't negotiate i needed it well i wanted it and there was only one on the internet to buy so i wasn't going to take a chance and let that guy sell that one that retailer so i bought it um so so that's what i'm saying so the price thing is uh, to me right now it feels like most pickups are about 150 bucks unless you're going towards you know the inexpensive stuff from guitar fetish and brands like that that make really affordable pickups um but for me the es335 guitar i mean you know for blues i mean you it's tough. It's a, it's tough. It's a tough thing. I, cause I, you know, there's only my preference is what I can tell you. What would I put in it? I'll tell you what, this is the most horrible answer ever, but it's my answer. And I want to stick with it. Uh, Sunday's pickup video. Cause I didn't do a pickup video cause, um, last Sunday, and I apologize to everybody who's been liking the pickup Sunday video series and just to out myself and why it happened. It, it was, a. Uh, totally my fault. I pushed back the editing, which is the video you're going to see this Sunday. I pushed back the editing. I was going to do the last, some of the last minute editing last minute. And on Saturday, my wife's like, Oh, well, my parents will be here tomorrow at noon. And I'm like, for what? She's like Easter. <laughs> I was like, I thought Easter is like in April. <laughs> I'm not even making this up. This is what I said to her. I was like, Oh yes. Yeah, I'm like, Oh, that would explain it. I think somebody said happy Easter to me on, on the podcast. So long story short, I didn't get the video out in time, so it'll come out this Sunday. These pickups that I'm reviewing this Sunday, these are the pickups I would tell you to uh, to put in that guitar, which I'll just tell you what they are. They're the Fortitude in the Path Anniversary set, and the, but I'll explain why in that video. That will, uh, so that's what I would go with. <laughs> By the way, we're at the hour and 20-minute mark, so... Uh, we're going to cut off super chats so we can get to super chats and non super chats and all that stuff. And I appreciate you guys all supporting me every Friday for this. So James Anderson's the last super chat of the day. Like I said, if you put a super chat past that, I know I say that and then sometimes we go past, but I don't think I will today. Cause I don't know. <laughs> we'll see. All right. Let's get back to, um, 
to the next question, which is Mathis. Mathis says, hey, Phil, greetings from Sweden. Fret leveling beams always seem to be shorter than the neck, so it is. it seems really hard to take material off completely even even way across all frets, also radius versus non-radius beams. Okay, super, super easy. Yeah, you don't want the radius, uh, you don't want it to be the length of the neck. Um, I understand the logic and why you think you do, right? Because you're like, oh, it makes sense, I'll catch everything. But really, you know, I think you gotta, <laughs> I always tell everybody, you gotta relax on the guitar uh, repair part. You know what I mean? In other words, when you're doing stuff, you know, the more focused you get on you know trying to make it right you you don't realize the history of the people who came before you making these things so to get take a sanding beam you don't need it to be super long i i use a sanding beam i think mine's 19 inches i think that sounds right the one i use that if i use a sanding beam so i like it um it works perfect for me and uh i don't need it to be any longer and most most and most players or most repair people can even get away with a shorter one, <laughs> you know what I mean? You can use a six inch, uh, uh, sanding beam, or you can use a six inch file to do all your, uh, your frets, the top of your frets. It, it, it's really just a preference. Again, here's what I really want to hone in. And this is not from me. This is not me going, Hey, I've been repairing guitars for so many years. Let me tell you guys, this is the benefit of the YouTube channel of now interviewing and hanging out with so many luthiers and so many repair people around the world, physically around the world. What I've seen is this, everyone kind of, before the internet told everybody what to do, everybody kind of figured out their own thing. There was a few that went to like Roberto Van schools and they got this like kind of like this standard, like this is how you do it. But even then, when you talk to them, they have the same, they say, they'll tell the same stories. Well, this is how you do it, but that's how I really do it. In fact, I got used to hearing this, but this is how, shh, don't tell, this is how I do it. Not shh, like don't tell my secret. Shh, don't tell everybody I'm not doing the right way. <laughs> There's so many people doing it. And what I learned is there's a ton of ways to do something. So um, everybody does it their own way. But what I learned about that is, why that's important is, you need to, when you're starting out, be taught a some way that makes sense to you. But don't be afraid that if you're more comfortable with doing it one way, do it that way. So your next part of your question, which ties into this, is radius blocks versus non-radius beams, right? Which do you use? Well, you can use both. I use both in different scenarios. It depends on what I'm trying to achieve. So I have both, and you've seen me do videos with both, and there's reasons why that. Sometimes it depends on the type of guitar. It depends on what I'm really going after, right? It, 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 there's a ton of reasons why you want to do something. The reason why I say there's reasons, let me give you a scenario why you would want to maybe use one and not the other, and then I take a drink of water real quick. The main reason is, is that the goal should be to take the least amount of material away from the frets. Okay. That's your goal. Whenever you're doing anything to your frets, whenever you're doing anything to any guitar, you do not want to remove material from the guitar. That's what you don't want to do. That's a perfect world, right? Think about a perfect world. Perfect world is you get a guitar with stainless steel frets and you never do anything to it the whole life of the guitar. That's a perfect world. So the next perfect world is you get a guitar, doesn't matter what frets, and you got to do a little bit of crown level or a little bit of fret sprout and you do a little bit of work. So you see how this works? It keeps getting worse, right? And then the less, little less perfect world is now we got to level and crown the, or, you know, crown and level, well, level and crown the frets a couple times throughout its life, right? So you want to remove the least amount of material. The radius ones to me take more material because obviously they're radius. They're going to kind of force you to take the materials off the ends of the frets more so. They actually literally cut the frets or take away material exactly less in the middle and more on the sides. It The result is great because you can do bends and it's great, but you're really, really making it harder to do that next time around if you get a little aggressive. So it that's why I said you look at every scenario like what can I do to take the least amount of material away and what will, what will end with the best result? And that's why sometimes you do those decisions. And sometimes it's just easy. The radius blocks are pretty damn easy. Depends on what you want to do. I've done both. I, I switch depending on the customer or what I'm doing, my personal choice that day, my thought. Um, sometimes it's just as stupid as I shoot from my hip going, I think this is where I, I think I'm going to end up, <laughs> you know what I mean? So let's do it this way. And after that, I hope that kind of gives you some insight. Um, broke FX, <laughs> I'm going to say it. broke FX says, Hey Phil, uh, new guitar day for me. Awesome. It says uh, Fender, uh, first Gibson Les Paul, 2016 studio 
HP. Anything I should know about titanium nut and saddles, maintenance and thoughts. Well, so I'm assuming because you have the, the 2016 Studio HP, you have and you have titanium because you have the after nut, the nut that they used after they used the brass one. So, because that's what they were doing. Gibson had made uh, made a decision to replace all the brass nuts that were wearing out. It's really weird. That scenario really made people, I noticed like guitar players go, brass is horrible because it wears out. Those nuts did, but not all brass nuts do. It depends on the thickness and what they're... Um, so I don't think you have to do anything <laughs> to that. And once they, the titanium is the fix, is what I'm getting at. You, you, you have the aftermarket fix. Like, so if you told me you had a 2016 with the brass nut, I would say contact Gibson and see if you can get the titanium, but you already have it. Maintenance and thoughts? No, nothing really. I mean, uh, you know, that stuff's pretty straightforward. I, there's nothing really to worry about. It's a great guitar. Um, you know, I, I mean, obviously I'm a fan of Gibson's for that reason. I know some people like, you know, they always, everybody has an opinion. I don't know. Some people love Gibson's. Some people hate them. I own more Gibson's than any other guitar, I think. That's that's all I can say about Gibson's for me. That's I think that sums it all up. I have no idea how to say this name. <laughs> but I have no idea. I apologize. I'm gonna say Ve. <laughs> Veus. I, I, it looks like Veus Veuslavic. Is that is it Slavic? Uh, phonetically, it looks like right. Again, if I ever butcher you guys' names. Like I said, this is like reading side-ons. It doesn't even feel like real real words to me. Okay, but I, Veyu Slavic, I think that's what I'm going to go with, and I apologize. It says, hey, Phil, I got a HSS Professional Strat. Uh, the Yosemite single coil pickups are good, but not digging the humbucker. Any recommendations for a replacement? I'm thinking the SD Pearly Gates. The Seymour Duncan Pearly Gates would be a good pickup for that. Sure, I'd like that even maybe more so than the JB in that type. Uh, guitar for sure uh straight straightforward i think you're looking the right way the only thing you want to be prepared for is i am pretty sure when you install your seymour duncan pearly gates you will need to reverse the wires in other words you will remember earlier we we're talking about seymour duncan's black is the lead hot and then green and your bare are your grounds and then you're going to you know tie off your yellow or yellow white and red uh, in this particular scenario, I bet you I would really be willing to bet that you're going to have to take the green as the hot and the black to the ground. Just be prepared. When you go to do it, just remember I said that and Google it. <laughs> uh, and the reason I'm telling you to do that is if you don't do it the way I just said right now, what's going to happen is it's going to sound great in the, hot, in the first position. In position two, it's going to sound like it's going to sound like this. Uh, out of phase and weird. Uh, and so sometimes you have to do that when you're mixing Seymour Duncan's with Fender pickups. So be prepared for that. But I think it's a good a good combo. That's uh, that's nice. Pearly Gates, I'm trying to think of anything else. Like I said, I don't think I'd go with... It's because you're saying Pearly, Pearly Gates, I wouldn't recommend JB. Seth Lovers might be good because we talked about those earlier, but Pearly Gates would be good. Good combo for that. Michael says, Hey, Phil, I'm really gassing for one of the hand-varnished Eastman... T64 Vs with Lawler P90s. Is there anything else with the same specs and price worth checking out? Um, well, nothing that's going to not be three times that. I mean, if you think about those those specifications, you're you're now looking at Collins. You're looking at the, the Gibson uh, Custom Shop. I mean, you're you know Heritage even, uh, but Heritage won't have the Lawlers, right? You'll, but um, and neither would well the the Collins will. The Gibson won't have Lawlers, but. Uh, no, I think you're you're good with that. Look, the Eastman stuff's an easy thing to figure out for everybody. Okay, it, it's it's really easy. You, uh, Eastman makes great guitars. They make really good quality, really interesting guitars, and they sound great and they play great. They're just import models, and that sometimes bugs people for some reason. Right? Everybody's got an opinion about this stuff. If that's not the case with you, then you're fine. That's the thing. I even think the resale value is pretty good, in my opinion, for what they. For, for what they're competing against and what's going on. So that's really good. I like them. Uh, Eastman Guitars is just a guitar that's never lined up in my life to get one. But uh, that, what I mean is I've never picked one up and played one really besides you know working on a couple of customers. And uh, I think there was a couple of bizarre guitar down in Phoenix, Arizona that I tried years ago. And everyone I've always picked up I liked, but nothing really like that said, oh, I need this right now. 
L. Scott Music said, greetings. I have a GNL ASA, L, I'm going to say ASAT, uh, classic. Uh, the fifth fret harmonic won't ring out when the neck pickup is selected. Works on position one and two. Know why? Yeah, I do. That is very common with guitars uh, that the harmonics don't work on the neck pickup and they do on the bridge pickup. And there's a couple reasons why. And it could be those reasons combined or any one of those reasons. So this is something you will notice with a lot of guitars. All of you guys that have guitars at home, you'll notice this too if you want to try it tonight with your guitar. You can take any guitar and uh, switch it to the neck humbucker and hit harmonics and notice that they're not only not ringing out, sometimes they don't work at all. Sometimes they work, but they're very, they just die. And if you go back to the bridge, again, you hit the harmonic on the neck and go, beep. It's like it's going to die, go to the bridge, and it'll be, woo, they take off again because it's there. Uh, sometimes it has to do with the placement of those pickups. That's why where those pickups are sitting is important. So sometimes the pickup is maybe too close or too far away from the bridge to really pick up the, har uh, the harmonic. That is uh, one reason why it would do. It's the placement of the pickup. So, and it has nothing to do with anything other than every guitarist have just slightly different placement of where they put their pickups. The second thing that could be causing it, and again, in any factors of conjunctions of these, is the pickup itself. The pickup is different. The way it's voiced, it's it's different, right? Um, one scenario that I found does this is when they uh, underwind the inner coil of a humbucker in a guitar. So, for instance, you have a humbucker, and the coil that's uh, the coil that is closest to the bridge of the two coils in the neck position is wound with less winds than the other coil and you need you need by placement you need that coil to really be kind of picking up that harmonic and it's not doing it because the other pickup is more dominant with the two if that makes any sense that's kind of the way i have illustrate that the great news is that's not a defect in your guitar okay that's a reason why some players don't pick certain guitars because they make music and they want a harmonic off the uh uh the uh, uh neck. How I discovered this was in the Somnium guitar, uh, when I go through all my guitars, some guitars like, like yours, some guitars will do harmonic on the neck and some guitars won't. And I was like, okay, so it's definitely a placement of the pickup issue. Okay. However, with the Somnium guitar and doing experiments, what I learned was, because the Somnium guitar is exactly like that. If I put two uh, Seymour Duncan JB in a jazz in this guitar and hit the harmonic on the neck pickup, I will get that same muted no tone. However, if I change out certain pickups when I get to certain ones, certain pickups will let that harmonic come out and sing like clean and, and crisp and perfect. So that basically what I'm getting at is don't worry about it if it's, if it's, it's not a problem because it's what it's supposed to do. But if it's bugging you, you can fix it with a pickup and you're just gonna have to figure that out. My guess is you're gonna probably have to go with a little bit hotter pickup than what they have in the neck and something that has a little bit more in the high frequency range to compensate for what's choking that off. And the reason I say that is because one thing, I want you to think of it mentally like this. Imagine when you're doing harmonics, even on your bridge, I want you to think about your tone control and as you back that off, right? Eventually, same thing, even on your bridge, you can't really hear the harmonics anymore. They choke out because of that tone control. That's essentially what your neck pickup is doing. That's why pickup selection is important for guitars. And not every, not every pickup is perfect for every scenario. Okay, Brad Guitar Miller. What's up, Brad? Um, he says, Phil, thanks for the feedback on the fret rockers. You inspired me to give one away. You picked the winner. At... Oh, okay, so basically, if you remember, Brad sent me a aluminum, aluminum uh, fret rocker, and uh, it's cool, and I showed it on the channel, and he's now put some in production, and he's selling them on eBay, and uh, he sent me some cool stickers this week and some pics and stuff, or maybe it was last week. I don't remember it. I, it all kind of blends together in my weeks. <laughs> That's what COVID gives me. It's like this, I don't even know what day it is until Friday. Um, and so he wants to do a giveaway for one. So, and that reminds me of some other stuff to give away too today. So let's spend some time giving some stuff away. Why not? You guys hanging out right now or why can't I see? Oh, there it is. Sorry about that. I apologize, everybody. Let's, let's give some stuff away. So first let's give away a fret rocker. Um, this is one of those things like I'd really hate to give a fret rocker to somebody who has one because fret rockers are expensive. It's the most expensive piece of metal. <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> Somebody's going to be like, oh, you have no idea. <laughs> Nathan says, pick me. Well, Nathan, because you said pick me. Now you have to pick the winner. So Nathan, uh, Nathan's going to pick somebody. 
Uh, so all I need you to do is put in the comments that, uh, you know, you need one. If you need a fret rocker, I, everybody needs one. So if you don't have a fret rocker, just put need one. And Nathan, you grab me a name and you, whatever name Nathan puts, I'm going to say wins the fret rocker. And um, we'll do that. And uh, there you go. So that makes that easy. And uh, what's nice is I will put a link. I can't do it right now, but I'll put a link when I do the timestamps to uh, to Brad's fret rockers. Because like I said, they're really cool because he rounded them. He was a, he basically did it because of something I said about fret rockers being sharp and heavy because they're steel and they're pointy. And his is rounded on the edges and aluminum or aluminum for, you know, I like to say both ways for. Did, did Nathan pick somebody? Nathan like he's like I, he signed off he left anyone Nathan you got it yet because that'll be fun you can give something away and then I'll give something away next okay Nathan says oh man so much pressure yeah well that's what you gotta do just do it random just pick somebody pick the coolest sign on you think is cool pick the worst sign on Make the, that's the winner Okay, it's Gretsch Zeppelin. Ah, well, here's what's cool. See, this was great. I know Nathan well enough to know why you picked that. He loves Gretsch <laughs> and Zeppelin, but mostly Gretsch. So, Gretsch Zeppelin, you just won. So, Gretsch Zeppelin, if you could send me a message to askknowyourgear at gmail.com, I will get that information to Brad, and he'll send you out a fret rocker. And then uh, and then, and everybody else watching the rebroadcast, there'll be a link if you want to check him out. I think he's only like $15 for them, which, like I said, is expensive but not because fret rockers can be 40 bucks, you know, depending where you buy them and what, but his is pretty reasonable. And then since we did that, let's, let me give some stuff away too. So I had a company called Tone Shack and I say a company, I want to be very, very clear. It's a, it's a, it's a person, <laughs> right? It's, it's not an army of people. It's a, it's a person trying to make a living or do cool things out there. And what they did, and it's a really interesting idea. They sent me some a choice of, these are a bunch. They sent me more than these, so many of these, but I, I can only send out so many at a time. So what these are are capacitors. And uh, I want to show you one. And this one's the first one I want to show you. He, he made a treble bleed. Let me go there. So this is a treble bleed. And what he's doing is like hand picking out. This is new old stock, like capacitors and stuff. Um, and so he made this beautiful treble bleed. And uh, what's nice is for me is I can put this in an envelope and send it out. So it's not going to be crazy expensive to send it out to you guys. Uh, maybe throw some stickers in there and stuff. So he sent that and he sent, this is a capacitor set for a telly. And what he does is he's using new old stock and hand, so, uh, hand testing them and checking them and making sure they're, and he's giving you all the specifications on them. Very cool. This might seem silly to some of you, but to some of you, you really know what's going on here. You know, this is a big deal, right? Um, uh, some capacitors are just, I don't want to say the magic. That just seems too too silly to say. But there's something about certain capacitors that are really cool that do things really cool to your tone controls. So let's keep my life easy. Uh, here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to pick a winner today. I'm going to do this for a couple of weeks. I'm going to pick a winner today, and here's how it works. Whoever I pick gets to tell me when they email me which one they want. You can have a treble bleed to, oops, treble bleed to install on any guitar you want. You can have the Stratocaster one, or you can have the set for the Telecaster. Uh, and then again, I put a link to his uh, his eBay a Reverb store. So if you want to check out stuff, and caps uh, caps are cool because um, you know these are like expensive and expensive meaning it's like eight dollars a piece right so i mean it's expensive for a capacitor but it's not in the grass in the grand scheme of things of what he's doing and i always like it because it's a great first project for someone who wants to use a soldering iron it's a great first project for somebody who wants to mod a guitar it's a great thing to do to a guitar to get a little bit of change in tone for almost a little bit of no money right does that make sense uh so there you go um so here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to pick a winner. <laughs> uh, and and uh, here's here's how I'm going to ha how I'm going to pick the winner. <laughs> um, all I want you to do is put treble bleeds don't suck for Lawrence. Because, <laughs> you know, he doesn't like them. So that's fine. And so, by the way, just put that, just put uh, treble bleeds don't suck. I will look up and pick somebody randomly and then uh but you don't have to pick that one you can pick any one of the three when you email me and um 
and I'll send it out and then I'll try to do this a couple of times a week. It'll be fun. Uh, just to just say thank you to those people who, uh, who are hanging out live. Um, Okay, I picked, I just, I did it real fast because I just saw the first, it was the first one I grabbed. It was Mitchell. Uh, Mitchell, uh, Mitchell is the winner. Uh, so Mitchell, email me at uh, askknowyourgear at gmail.com. Um, I want to say, I want to say thank you to, to I'm Not Old, I'm Vintage. I, I saw yours, but I saw your second. Even though I think you were before him, I literally looked up and I saw Mitchell's name first. So uh, Mitchell, same thing, just email me and I'll, I'll get these out to you, our uh, and I'll actually do it. Usually I make my wife do it, but this is easy. I'll put an envelope for you guys. So <laughs> there you go. A little fun, a little fun. We'll take a little, little fun, little break. Okay. So on that note, let's get back to questions. And, um, the next one is from Michael says, oh, no, I, we did Michael's, uh, we did, uh, we're on Byron. Byron says, how does the Court G300 compare to an Ibanez AZ? That's a great question. So he's talking about the Court uh, G300 that I reviewed, which had the uh, roasted maple neck uh, and, and to the Ibanez AZ. Um, I like the Court G300 neck better. The Court G300 was a funny, funny guitar uh, that happens. That, that guitar is a funny scenario that happens on YouTube. As you guys know, when you get to review stuff, when, you know, that's how it works. You review stuff and after a while you build this channel up and you get to a point where companies are like, you know, they'll send you gear so you can review it, which is good, right? It gives you content, gives us stuff to watch, gives us stuff to do. And sometimes it gives you free gear, which is cool, right? And, but in every scenario, you know, keeping free gear is not always the best because it's good, but you can't keep everything. The G300 was probably one of my favorite guitars I reviewed in the last couple dozen guitars, you know, um, actually I'll, I think it's funny. I think if I was going to say what my favorite, and I really liked all the guitars, the, the PRS, uh, SEs were great. That Ibanez, uh, RG 565 was great. I mean, a lot of great guitars to mention, but when I think right now of the last, let's say dozen guitars I reviewed, the ones that stick out in my head, they're really exciting. Like I enjoyed the, the video more than any other. It was that, it was that music man access and that court G 300. I don't know what it is. I just really enjoyed those two guitars. Um, to where I was like, I was enjoying playing them. And I can tell because the more I like a guitar, the more editing I have to do because I wouldn't stop playing it. Right. I have all of a sudden I have 35 or 45 minutes of me playing that I have to cut down because I'm just sitting there playing in front of the camera. Um, the court G 300 was great, but it had to go back. It, it went back to, to court. Uh, if it didn't go back, I would have probably kept it and played the crap out of it. Uh, in fact, I can tell you right now, although I'm a fan of Seymour Duncan pickups, I probably would have kept it, took the pickups out and put something else in them. And it probably the Pete, the Thornbuckers. I would have probably would have put the Thornbuckers in that guitar and then play the guitar. Cause that would be the thorn. That would be the, the, the Sir Pete Thorn guitar I'd want. <laughs> right. It, it was black. Uh, if I got a, if I got a Pete Thorn Sir guitar, I'd get the black one. I was looking at one this year or well, whatever, few, last few months, but it was, it's three grand. And I just, you know, just, I'm not there yet, <laughs> but, uh, uh, that guitar would have like filled that itch. I could still buy one, I guess, but I've also learned this other horrible thing that happens when you review guitars and they go, you review it. Like I reviewed that model. And if I, I, I so when I had to send it back, I sent it back, but I think sometimes like, Oh, I should buy one, but I'm afraid if you buy one, if you get it, your mind plays tricks on you. All of a sudden you're like, Oh, this isn't as good as the one I had. You know what I mean? So it messes with you. But that's what I, so I liked it. So the, your question is, how does it compare to the, the Ibanez AZ? Um, I mean, quality-wise, it's on par with it, especially the Ibanez A Indonesian. Uh, Playing-wise, I probably would have kept it. Uh, think of this. If they would have said le you can, it could stay, I probably not only would have kept it, but I would have probably just sold the Ibanez AZ Indonesian uh, just because it filled you know, it fills the, the need of that style of guitar with that neck. And I would have put the Thornbuckers in it. So Grumpy Mike Guitar, what's up, Grumpy Mike this week? He says, for the tone jar and why not? By the way, have you had a chance to try the Greg Cock Fishman P90s? I have not. I have not done that yet. Uh, in fact, I not only have not, I have no no plans to do so. <laughs> I should say, uh, plans meaning there's, it's not on the, uh, it's not on the board, uh, for the pickup videos, um, to do. Um, I secured one company, which I was very impressed with, a, a nice company from, uh, England, uh, contacted me and asked if they could be on the, 
uh, pickup video, you know, pickup Sundays. And uh, so they're shipped out pickups and they're on their way. Super easy. Uh, I'll, you know, of course, I'll state all that in the video, but it was super cool. They sent me a set of pickups and they paid for two cartridges. You know what I mean? They paid to, 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 to pay, help me pay for the modules on the thing, which is really nice. So, uh, and, um, so that's happening, but yeah, as far as there's anybody else like Fishman and stuff, I, you know, none of those companies have reached out or anything. And so I haven't had a chance to reach out because I already have videos to make and that's I'm trying to stay focused on those, but I hear, I'm sure they're great. I mean, I think Greg Cock has a great year and I think it, you know, I mean, I think what he does is always great. It sounds like, it's great, so great. But, I mean, I don't, you know, it's hard to say compliments when you have no reference of it other than by its reputation. Uh, John's question was, found a new snake Kramer, have two strats, an 09 American Standard SSS with ebony and a 17 Deluxe in a reddish burst and maple. Which one would you trade? Oh, my God, that's horrible. For, what a horrible question to give me. <laughs> it's like, which kid do you want to keep? <laughs> uh, this is not as bad as that but it's bad i'm like no one's ever asked me which guitar should i get rid of what oh uh. hmm you're gonna hate my answer you're gonna hate my answer i know it but it's my answer and you asked for it okay ready i wouldn't give up either one of them you have two strats okay you have a 2009 american standard okay which with ebony which is, again, cool as hell, because that's unique. You don't see ebony on. Uh, my red telly, uh, you can't see behind the keysel, is an ebony uh, uh, fender. And then your 2017 Deluxe is a red burst with maple. Uh, well, here's the thing. You say 17 Delu seven, 2017 Deluxe. I'm assuming it's the American Deluxe. Basically, what I'm saying is, I try to give advice based on what I would do, what, what I do as a huge fan of Snake Sabo, as a, a huge fan of that guitar. Obviously, if you see my interview, I would not sell either one of my American fenders to buy one. I can't do it. <laughs> uh, it's, it's a, cool as hell guitar the graphic is cool the pickup you know is, is a cool you know it's cool it, but at the end of the day it's a thousand dollar made in indonesia very uh you know it's a crane cra indonesian kramer guitar you know what i mean i don't know if i would want to get rid of my one of my usa made fenders for it um here's why so, you know, and uh, this is why it's important. Not for the reason you're thinking, not for the whole, hey, America first, you know, and Indonesia second thing. I don't know. You know what I mean? It's not because it's import. It's because in 10 years, you, you, well, not even 10 years, it's harder to buy those American strats. It'll be harder to buy them again. You, if you wait, you will find a deal on probably a Snake Kramer, maybe. But, American strats will just keep going up in value. I think that's going to happen no matter what. I think American made guitars are just going to keep going up in value forever because it's it's not has nothing to do with guitars are made. I love it when the comments are like, "Oh, guitars are made great everywhere." They are, but guitars are not really determined by <laughs> their value is not determined by how good or bad they are. Usually, the de the value is determined by their availability. That's just the reality of it. Okay. That, that drives it more than anything else, okay? Nothing is quantifiable. Nothing is guaranteed. But the this stupid guitar, this is a main Japan Steve I graphic or whatever with this thing. These things, people are asking like eight not eight grand now. They're not going to get that. They're asking eight grand now. Uh, they were worth two. Or they're probably worth four now, right? Why? Because half of you are going, that ugly thing, and some of you, half of you are going, that beautiful thing, it doesn't matter what you think of this guitar. It doesn't matter how it sounds. It doesn't matter if it's made in Japan versus wherever. It, it's hard to get. Hard to get guitars go up in value because they're hard to get. <laughs> uh, so, so yeah, the American Strats, I w if they're both American-made uh, Stratocasters or, you know, U.S.-made, whatever you want to say, uh, I wouldn't get rid of either one. Um, that would be my... That would be my decision not to do that. And of course, I, again, think about this. I'm like you, obviously a huge fan. The interview made me even like him even more. I always thought he was cool. And then the interview I did with him, 
uh, you know, obviously you guys, if you saw it, and I'm John, I'm thinking you saw it. He was like the kindest guy out there. And I, you know, that's how he was. So he was super kind and nice. But yeah, I don't think I could, I could do that. So uh, I wouldn't get rid of either one. That's my answer. Let me know what you did though. <laughs> I'm just really curious. Yes. You don't have to super chat me next week or anything. You can send me an ask near your gear. Just put answer to question. You know what I mean? Uh, anything, anytime any of you guys super chat me, by the way, and ask me a question, I give you a piece of advice. If you ever want to tell me how that worked out for you, send it to ask near your gear. Um, ask near your gear gets so many damn emails that I actually have somebody help me now. And I had somebody before, remember, we, I've always had somebody kind of help me get through these emails uh, to, to kind of categorize them and figure out what to do with them. Um, but stuff like that always gets flagged when you put in the comment section, like, you know, you know, just put in the, the subject what, you know, resp you know re response to your advice and let me know. And then, it, you know, that way I can update everybody else. Again, it's kind of cool to know what you do. So there you go. The other thing I will tell you is, John, which is I feel a little guilty saying this, okay? Because I don't know your personal situation and I don't want to, you know, again, give financial advice to anybody, but, but I, and I don't want to give you, tell you to do something that's going to be detrimental, but they do sell that Kramer Sabo on, at AMS on a payment plan. <laughs> so I would find some pedals and crap that I really don't need. And I would slowly move that stuff off and put it on a payment plan. That's what I would do. There you go. Okay. Uh, Adam says, I finally got the next tone special and I love it. Now have two amps. I no longer need what. Okay. Uh, oh, so you have two amps he doesn't need because he got the next tone. What's your advice on the best ways to sell them and and what for? Uh, one is a Line 6 Spider V30 and the other is a Marshall MG15 CD. Y you got to go to Craigslist, man. That stuff is just, there's no value to sell that on Reverb. The shipping, all that stuff will be a nightmare. It won't be worth it. You literally want to sell those uh, on Craigs. And it's super easy. You just go to Reverb, type in those items on Reverb, hit the, on the left-hand column, go down. There's going to be a sell tab, what they sold for, sold for tab. Look at what they sold for. Um, and then kind of kind of base your pricing off that. You can go to eBay too for, you know, history of that stuff. But, you know, Reverb's good. Go to Reverb, look what they sold for. And then, you know, put or put a, go to, you know, Facebook, offer up, whatever, Craigslist, put a price on those. Um, and... Uh, and then be just keep working them down. I, I don't understand why everybody does it this weird way. Here's why I don't understand. And this is Adam. So this is my advice since you asked for this. You put them on Craigslist for the price you hope to get. Let's put an arbitrary number. Uh, MG15 CD, you know, 75 bucks. I don't know. I don't know what they go for. Don't go off that number. Just I'm just going off a guess. 75 bucks. Then in a week when no one answers you, or if you sell it right away, great. But if no one answers you, then you take the price down. <laughs> you lower it and you wait. I don't understand the, you know, I have, I, there are things on my local Craigslist. All of you guys have the same Craigslist. It's like whatever Craigslist store you have, it's the same store everywhere you go. Craigslist is like basic training. I don't care where you went to basic training. Everybody has the same basic training stories, right? Craigslist I don't understand when I, I have, there are products on my local Craigslist that have been up there for two freaking years. And the person relists them every week for the same price for two years. It's insane. And, <laughs> and I think, I understand you want to wait till you get your price, but Jesus. So same with you. I would uh, pick a good price, put them in, and then as, no, if it, as, you know, hopefully you sell them, but if no one does offer or anything for them, lower them and lower them until the price point. And, and you know, because you want that to be a quick, you know, get rid of those and go. So there you go. That would be my suggestion. Of course, if anyone has any suggestions for them too, I'd add those in. Uh, Viva Hospital. <laughs> I don't, there. I'm, my best, that was my best try. Uh, any advice on installing a treble bleed? Is there anything specific you recommend to do that needs... Uh, to do to do different values for humbuckers and sink coils. Sure, there's all kinds. Look, you can get all kinds of great treble bleed information on different values and different ways to do this stuff. I have tried tons of them, and there are tons in every guitar. Ibanez uses a different one than PRS. PRS uses a different one than uh, you know than the, some of the aftermarket ones. Uh, you know, than what Fender uses. Everybody uses different ones. Uh, here's what I've kind of kind of figured out for myself on those, and that's why I suggest them the way I do. I, I've tried the 
you know, I got the, com- the expensive ones and then I got the cheap ones and I tried all these different ones and I do, I don't know, man, I can't really tell. The, their differences are so subtle in, in what it does. It's, it's up to everybody to figure out. But what I use is basically the cheap ones because I can make lots of them. <laughs> and I put them in. And if I have a problem, then I maybe I think about it. But the ones I basically use are the, the, the least expensive components. I think the ones I make, I think if I figure out what I pay for both of those components, I think it's like three something, 350. And that makes sense because I think retail, if you bought one like you know from somebody making you one, they're going to charge you like seven bucks. So I pay like three bucks for it. And I put it in. And it's, it works super easy. What I will tell you is don't overthink your... If you've never had one in a guitar before, a treble bleed for rolling the back the volume, uh, just just make one or buy an inexpensive one and stick it in and see how it goes. And then installing it's super easy, man. You just you don't even need to install it. Um, you can get little uh, alligator clips. Clip them in uh, if you want to do that. You, you, know, you don't even have to actually solder them in just to try it. That's what's great about them. Oh, but if you do, just solder them in. Really super, super easy. Nothing... Nothing hard. I promise there's almost nothing to mess up in this scenario other than maybe burning your fingertip for a second if you do that wrong. Okay, Julia's question is, how do I repair a Squire Affinity Telecaster Bridge height screws are smaller than the ones on Amazon? Let me make sure I understand this question. Hold on a second. How do I get smaller bridge height screws? Does anyone sell bridge for Squire Affinity? I see what you're saying. So I'm assuming what you're saying in your scenario is you bought a bridge from like Amazon or somewhere, and the uh, the screws are too long on the new bridge. I hope that I'm understanding the cor- question correctly. The only thing I'm g- asking this is, I want to make sure this is clear. I'm assuming you have the original screws that put on the original bridge. You can reuse those. That's There's nothing wrong with that. So, uh, there, your options are simple. You have basically a bunch, but let's say three basic options that I think will work well for you. Option one is you can use the original screws that were installing the bridge. Uh, they will probably work fine and they're the right height. And the only issue is maybe if they're not a little bigger, you may have to shove like a toothpick in there or something. You know what I mean? Just to kind of make them bite a little harder into the hole. Um, that's what I would suggest is an option one. If that works, that's going to be the easiest, right? And that's assuming you have the original screws and all those things work out for you. If that doesn't work, the next option is you can take the screws that came with the bridge down to Ace Hardware. It's the same old world it's always been at Ace Hardware um, uh, is you walk in that store and there's going to be a person in there and they're literally like, what you need? And you go, I need this. And you go, this much shorter and they go to those bays of like 5,000 screws and they give you the right ones. (laughs) I go there at least once a month. (laughs) It's the same. It's always the same. It's amazing. Um, and, and then they'll find them for you. They'll put them in a little bag and they'll go there. There you go. Ring them up at the counter and you'll look down and be like 41 cents. And you'll be like, Holy crap. And then you'll laugh when you run your debit card for 41 cents. (laughs) Uh, so yeah, that's option two. Option three is you could use a Dremel and cut those, uh, screws down. You could just cut the ends off of them and use the Dremel wheel to kind of, you know, sharpen up the tip a little bit and stick them back in there. That'll work too. I mean, all three of those options will work perfectly fine. You could go online and find shorter ones and stuff too. I mean, that's your fourth option, but I, like I said, I think those three options are pretty damn simple. So I would stick with those. Uh, Jimmy, uh, Jimmy T five sixty eight did two super chats. Thank you, man. I appreciate that. Uh, Johnny, Johnny UK park, Johnny UK park. Hi from Chandler. Is UK park? <laughs> Is this hi from Chandler? I thought he was going to be in the UK. It says hi from Chandler, Arizona. Uh, it says, thinking of getting my first acoustic guitar, but worried about the dry climate. Yep. It's a nightmare. Is it okay to leave it? on a stand if I use a room humidifier and monitor humidity level. Okay, so it depends on the type of acoustic you get. Obviously, if you get a laminated top, it takes more abuse than a solid top and a solid body. But the end result of all this is, don't don't overthink this. This is not that hard. Um, I know it's dry. You live where I live. Uh, There's a couple things that I would suggest to you. The, The guitars don't need to be overly humidified. 
You can use a room humidifier. That works great. You can buy a, a personal humidifier for the guitars. You can do that. That works great. I use no humidity on my, on my personal acoustic guitars. None. I don't humidify them in any way. Never have. Uh, never will. <laughs> I don't do it. Um, what I do is I... Um, I just maintain and watch them. At the beginning, once they're dry, they're fine. They got to dry out. The problem is where in Arizona, what really happens that sucks is, is not only when you buy a new guitar, it's how fast it dries out. That gets real scary because if it dries out too fast, it just can crack. There's things that can go wrong. But what really, really happens to guitars in Arizona, in our climate, is people live in other climates like Florida and the guitar never really fully dries out because it's a humid climate. And then they come to Arizona and then... It just dries out so fast that something goes wrong. So in your situation, I, I wouldn't really over overthink it. Um, one of the things you can do is like a stage down process is not even use a humidifier in the room. Just use a humidifier in the acoustic cell itself. You know, and there's like all kinds. There's, you know, obviously Music Nomad makes them. Daddario makes them. There's all kinds of humidifiers that are great out there. Go online. Pick one that fits your budget. Stick it in the sound hole. And slowly bring the humidity down on the guitar. In other words, use it, you know, every day and then go to it once a week and then eventually once a month, you know, just making sure it dries out slowly. That that helps. But uh, that's all if you're going to use a solid guitar. So when you're saying you're getting, thinking about getting your first acoustic, if you're thinking about getting like a laminate acoustic, uh, you know, especially like, don't even worry about it. It should take all the abuse. It's, it's really impossible for all those layers to dry out. That would be my suggestion to you is that do that. So... And also, also pay attention when you first buy an acoustic guitar, pay attention to everything that happens in the first 90 days of the guitar. That way, if anything goes wrong, it's the manufacturer that you can contact or the store you can do that with. So just make sure whatever, you know, make sure that the, if the top's drying out, if anything's happening bad, you want it to happen in the first three months. Uh, most companies will warrant him for one year, but I find 90 days is it's less, less aggravation for everybody, including you. Christopher says, I just got a Godin Multiac nylon. Sounds great and plays amazing. Why isn't there more love for the Godin? Uh, they're great. Love the show. Uh, well, you know, Larry Mitchell, my buddy, he plays a, gold, a Godin Multiac nylon uh, everywhere he goes, and he loves them. I uh, loved my Godin A6. I sold it to my buddy Matt because he asked me. <laughs> He's like, hey, if you ever sell that, I'll buy it. And I was like, all right. I wasn't using it, but I love it. I had no reason to sell it, no reason to keep it, you know, sort of thing speak. I love the Godin A6. Um, it's a thousand bucks new and it's fantastic. And you can buy them used even less than that. The multi axe even, even cooler with the nylon. If I was to get a, I have a one inexpensive nylon guitar. If I was going to get a nicer nylon guitar, I'd get the multi axe. I love it. Why isn't there more love for it? I don't know. I think part of the problem for Godin for me is I push Godin probably more than most YouTube channels for sure. I've I've done at least a dozen, and I'm no exaggerating, videos from five, you know, my five best guitars to the, you know, top this guitars to, you know, and I did a Golden Godin A6 review. I've done a ton of Godin reviews, and the Godin guys know, they've always sent me nice emails saying, oh, we saw your videos, great, but Godin doesn't interact with social media, so they don't send out guitars to review, so... Or at least they don't talk to me about it. Uh, so that's why you don't see them from a lot of channels because, again, they have to buy them. Um, and sadly enough, if I get another Godin right now, I'd probably get another Godin A6, and then there's no video for me on that because I've already done a Godin A6 video. But love them. Uh, I absolutely love Godin. I have nothing bad to say about Godin. I like everything about it. I even like that they uh, don't hold the greatest value resale because that means buying them used is just an awesome, awesome thing. And when you buy them new, they are so good. There's no reason to sell them. Uh, Roberto says, my boost pedal does not seem to work with an already distorted Marshall. Seems like the volume does not raise up to solo lead uh, level. Any trick... Uh, that I can share. Well, it depends on what you're doing. You got to understand boost pedals and how that works. A boost pedal, if you're running so much gain, because you're not saying what kind of Marshall, okay? So like to me, if I'm running a boost in front of like the 1987 or maybe even a JC-100, uh, you're not going to get more volume. You're going to get more distortion. Does that make sense? It's going to overdrive a little bit, kind of like a Tube Screamer. What you want, if you want the solo, if you want the volume to kick up, you got to run the boost either the either with pedals and, and then the boost, or you're going to boost in the effects loop of the amp and then set that way. That's what you're doing. 
That's what, or that's what you need to do. But I don't know what Marshall you're talking about. But I'm assuming it has an effects loop. And if it does, you put that boost in the you put that boost in the effects loop. It's going to be the exact opposite problem you have now. Right now you're you're running that thing on ten and kicking it, and you're like, why isn't it jumping? You put in the effects loop. You're going to have to run that thing on two when you kick it. It's going to jump up, and then you just set it. That'll fix that problem right away. Studio Rob says, "Hey Phil, new fan. Wanted to know any Epiphones you uh you'd." Oh, argue that are better than Gibson. Also, uh, okay. So I just want to make sure you heard of. I think it's Ert E A R T Ert headless guitars. Sometimes when we type, I don't know if you know it gets mistyped. Uh, I have you ever heard of them? I haven't heard of those guitars. Want to know my thoughts? <laughs> Unfortunately, I don't have any because I haven't heard of them. I have one, and they're insanely good. Three hundred bucks. Wow. Okay, so E A R T headless guitars. For 300 bucks. Cool. Uh, so you guys know about that. Check out the website. I'll put a link if I uh, when I get a chance to put it in the index. Um, so so that's cool. Uh, guitars, Epiphones that are better than Gibsons? I don't know if there's any Epiphones that are better than Gibsons. I mean, I think there's Epiphones I like as much as Gibsons and in some cases just as much. Did I just say that? <laughs> Almost as much and just as much. Better is a tricky thing. You know what I mean? It depends. Uh, nothing comes to my mind right now. I like a lot of the Epiphone necks. I like the way they feel over some of the Gibsons. Uh, I, and I'm a big fan of Epiphone. I, it's one of those guitars that just, again, same thing. I bought an Epiphone Muse to review. Somebody was asking me when I was going to get to that. I have no idea. <laughs> In fact, I almost might not even review it at all. Isn't that sad? Uh, just because. I got other guitars to do. That's it's the it's the downfall of this. It's getting to all this stuff. Uh, the Epiphone Muse guitar is in the last of all the guitars I'm going to review downstairs of guitars reviews. So I mean I'm sure I'll eventually get to it, but and um, but I like Epiphones, and I know a lot of you guys. Like I said, I've said this before. Um, when I did surveys with you guys, most of you guys own Epiphones. The majority of the audience owns at least a Epiphone, and. Um, and I like them. I was thinking about getting an Epiphone like ES-39. I, it, was, it was on the it was on my radar, and then it just slowly moved off. Um, Dennis says, hey. <laughs> he says, thanks for all the info and knowledge you share with us. My question is your opinion on the Fender Super Champ X2 cab and head. I absolutely love it. That's the... That's the reason why, if you guys watch the Tone Master amp video, I have the Tone Master over here. I bought a Tone Master. I told you guys I reviewed it. And if you guys follow the podcast, you guys know that I told you guys that I did a video and I talked to a friend and then I refilmed it. I actually did the video four times. There's four, <laughs> four versions of that video. And the Super Champ X2 is the problem for me, by the way. That's the problem that I'm having with this, the, the uh, Deluxe. I, I hope it's very clear in the video. I love the deluxe uh, Tone Master amp. I think it's great. It's a fantastic product. Uh, it's the price compared that's that's was hard for me to get past, and that's why I I I wanted to hone on that a little bit, not to to pe to get people to buy it or not buy it, to explain my problem with the value assessment of that. It's not that the amp's not good, and it's not that I don't think people should charge whatever they want, because they can charge whatever they want, whether or not I buy it or not. But when I think of the Super Champ X2 head and cabinet, and it's I say that because the cabinet has a 112 and this is a 112, but you know, you could do the combo as well. That amp, I think that amp still is 525 or 500 bucks head and cabinet, new. Sounds good. It's a good sounding amp. And to me, it's like it it sounds. Uh, to me, it sounds as good, different. It sounds different because it's a different amp, but it sounds as good as the Tone Master Deluxe. I really feel that way. I could tell you on it, and everybody's, you know, again, everybody's opinion is different. <laughs> I'm not saying, actually, I am saying, this is what I'm saying. If you gave me a Super Champ X2 head and cabinet, or you gave me the Fender Tone Master Deluxe and, and put me in front of people, I would be fine with either one. It would be they would both do a job. They're both super light. I mean, the head and that cabinet weigh nothing. I mean, they're not like 24 pounds, but I think the head's probably 10 and the cabinet's probably 15. The problem was it's half. 
so it becomes like, what am I really getting for double the price? Like what value assessment am I getting? So to my opinion of the Super Champ X2 is, it's one of my favorite fenders for the price. I think it really is fender at their best. What I mean by that is fender at their best, because the core of what fender was and what fender always impresses me with is how good they can make you something for affordable. I mean, I understand now we're talking about the Made in Mexico strats and Telly's hitting the $700 range, but still very impressive product for the price points. You know what I mean? For, for what they achieve. And I feel like the Super Champ X2 is no exception to that. It's not the greatest thing ever. It's not my favorite amp. It's not amazing in any way, but it has great effects. It sounds good. It's reliable. They take a good beating um, and they're affordable. You know what I mean? Especially, you you know, if you go used. So my point is that's, that's is great. I kind of feel like, um, I feel like the Tone Master was an amp that it's a great concept and I really like it. Like I said, I love everything about it, but I feel like it feels to me, this is how it feels. It feels not like it's an expensive amp to make and that's why it's a thousand bucks. It felt like they, they were smart and they looked at the market and they said, what would the market bear? And they think that they came up with the price, what they think we would pay for it. And they priced it such. It's not bad business. So I'm not, I'm not shaming them, not saying anything bad about that, but it also makes me aware that there's better value out there. So I love the X2 stuff. Um, what I liked about that Tone Master video was uh, the comments are all over the place. <laughs> They're like, uh, you know, everybody's like, yes. And then so we're like, no, I don't, it's so funny. It's like funny how polarizing that sometimes like pointing out some stuff is. My brother's keeper says the tone master is a great $600 amp. You know, what's funny about that is I agree with that. It's funny. I know that's not the nicest thing to say to a company when they put their time, their money, you know, they make a product. I don't want to judge everybody for this stuff, but man, dude, I really feel like I'm looking at it right now, $599. And I, I probably wouldn't have anything negative to say about it at all because anything I pointed out, like when I pointed out, when I critique the things in that video, the critiques are based on the price. Like I love it when people are like, you missed the point, Phil, the point of it was to be easy and streamlined. I'm like, right. But when I think easily and streamlined, I think affordable. A thousand dollars is not affordable. Not even in this market. Not even by a long shot. You know how I know? This is how I know. Because they have, there was 10 amps with the same type of features on the market for less money. That means that it's not the affordable series amp. The affordable amps, apparently, from, from what I can tell going on Sweetwater and AMS and all those places looking at what's in the market like this, was 500 bucks. That was where everything was sitting at. So, of course, Fender can get a premium, which is why I think it should be 600 bucks. They should be able to at least get 100 bucks. And I paid 750 for mine, and I don't feel like that was too outrageous. It was on the, definitely the, the top end of what I wanted to pay for that amp. But, yeah. But, like I said, it's interesting. Okay. Hold on a second. Okay, um, let's get, hold on. I'm just reading a couple of comments. Um, yeah, T Tanner says, that's basically my thought. When the Towmaster launched, it was cool. It sounds good, but I can't justify the price for what it is. Uh, yeah, I, I, think, I, think, I think that's the problem. And again, you know, it just tells me like, and that's kind of where I was going with that video is kind of like in this hopes, like a fender ever saw that, that kind of content. It was like, look, either put more stuff in it. So I feel like it's a, it solves every problem I ever wanted or ever had. And then that explains the price point or make the price point make more sense with what it is, which is a really good amp. That's really light, really cool for the average player. <laughs> you know what I mean? A thousand bucks is a lot. And, I, and, but again, I don't know. I don't build amps. So if they, you know, I can't tell you for sure that they can't do it for less. Um, okay. Uh, my name is Mike says, Hey, Phil, I'm building a HSS Strat. What neck and middle, uh, single coil pickups would pair well with a Seymour Duncan JB in the bridge? Um, 
that that's a good question. You could go with something. I mean, like I said, I tend to lean towards when you say a, like DiMaggio or Duncan or Bare Knuckles to lean into just using more of those type of pickups. They line up great. Line up meaning they sound great with each other. There's a reason why they work together. So using like the Seymour Duncan uh, single coil pickups, I'm not a big fan of their noiseless pickups. I mean, you can go with those, but uh, that's up to you if your needs. But you can go with like the SSL ones. You know, those are great. They work out great with a JB. That's a great combination. That's but I say great a lot today. <laughs> that's a good combination of pickups that work together in a lot of guitars. Uh, that's something I would basically uh, mention as a as a good good way of going. Uh, James says I'm working on a parts caster and I've lost two of the nuts that connect to the pots. Uh, oh, okay, it's for the pick guard. Are they small import? Wait, they are the small import pots, but the import pots nuts are too small. Okay, so basically he's lost the nuts to the uh, to the potentiometers is what I'm getting on that. I just want to make sure. They are the small ones, right? So, yes. Uh, sounds like, okay, I would love to give you advice like, hey, same thing, it's like I said earlier, like go to Ace Hardware and get those. But it sounds like a great opportunity to replace those potentiometers, man. They're inexpensive. Go on Amazon, wherever online source you like, or go to your local mom pop, wherever you go, you will find a good deal. Get, uh, you're doing a, a Strat, right? Kind of guitar. You get three potentiometers. You get three really nice ones. And uh, uh, you'll, you know, they'll have, you'll have to drill out the holes or ream out those holes for the new ones. But again, go on Amazon, get yourself a reamer. <laughs> okay. And uh, three, I don't know why one finger for three and three potentiometers that are nice quality ones. And uh, you won't regret that. And realistically, here's what I'm telling you. You paid me $10 to super chat the question. I'm assuming you have the, let's say $10 for the reamer. <laughs> <laughs> and and maybe another fifteen dollars to twenty dollars, so thirty bucks in parts, and that's rounding up for the reamer and those three pots. I think you'd be fine. That's what I would do. You know what I mean? Might might as well do it right. You do it right, you won't you won't regret it. Get it out of the way. Wes says uh, he just wanted to let me know he loves the videos. Thanks and enjoy a cold one. I will after this is over. I'm I'm a uh, I'm going to. I think I'm going to have a white claw though. Isn't that sad? I I don't know why that's sad. Uh, as uh, the carbs, <laughs> gotta cut the carbs. Um, HR says, I want to buy a Jazzmaster and a Duesenberg. Okay, why do I feel like I'll be judged and not worthy of these two guitars? Oh, okay, I like these questions. Uh, that's a psychology, there's nothing wrong with that. The uh, look, uh, we're we're the same, buddy. Here's why. Uh, I say a hey, buddy because it's HR, you could be a female. I don't know if you call buddies female. I don't think so. I think if I call my wife buddy, she'd like, like look at me funny. We're the same. I don't feel like I don't <laughs> when I play a Steve I guitar, <laughs> let me put it this way. I have a bald head like Joe Satrani, but I don't play like that. So when I pick up those guitars, I feel the same way. You know what I mean? Like I buy these guitars out of the admiration I have for these players and the the reminiscence that causes my mind, you know what I mean? It's my childhood, you know, of remembering when I couldn't have anything nice. <laughs> That's what they represent to me. This is the same as me owning these two guitars, no exaggeration, is the same, I would imagine, as if you did really well and you buy a Lamborghini and you're like, your whole life, you're like, man, I didn't have, like, you know, I had top ramen soup and, and, and like, literally, I have a Ferrari now. Like, you feel that. That's how I feel with those guitars. Like, I feel like you, you could, you have no idea. I swear, I feel like I have a Lamborghini. Like, I feel like I'm, I'm, I'm successful as hell. <laughs> people, people look at me I'm like, like, you rich? Pfft, I got a cool guitar that I wanted when it was like 1989. So, yeah. <laughs> I made it. <laughs> I did it. I got the thing I wanted when I was. 17. So yeah, it's all good now. I kind of feel like that. So that's my experience. What you're saying is, yeah, you don't feel like you're up to, and you're going to get judged and you're not worthy. You're totally worthy. That's crap. I say all the time that I say that because I relate to it. I relate to the crap. No, no, no one should judge you for what you do. If you're not hurting anyone, committing a crime, you know, right. Not doing anything wrong. No, you deserve it. You deserve it. You work hard, I assume, or you inherited a lot of money. Whatever it is, it's yours. You 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 do whatever you want with it, uh, and no one should judge you for a jazz master in Duesenberg. Those are freaking great guitars, and you'll feel like me. Here's what I will tell you: you will feel like me. You will after you buy them. You will feel like I don't know if I'm worthy of these, but you will feel like a I got a Lamborghini. 
There's a little bit of that, both. Try to lean into the Lamborghini feeling and less of the unworthy feeling. That'd be my advice. Aaron, Aaron Peacock says, Tip Jar, thanks for the awesome content. Love your reviews on the Tone Master. Thank you so much, buddy. I appreciate that. I got the blonde and love it. Yeah, it's a great amp. There's no question about that. <laughs> and 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 uh, I appreciate that you like the video. I really appreciated all the comments of people who said, I have one, I like it, but I kind of see some of your points. And some people said, I don't see some of your points, but I love that it's like, yeah, I got it. I'm Because like I said, I agree too. I like it. It's a really cool amp. Uh, ben Knight Products says, Hey, Phil, is the 64 Deluxe Reverb worth the price? And have you considered a video comparing the 64 to 65? So here is the problem with the 64 and the 65 comparison. They don't sound, to me, anything alike. I think most of the connection and the way they sound is the visual of it, that they <laughs> both Deluxe Reverbs. The 64 is very bright. It's a very bright amplifier. Um, and the question, is it worth the price? Uh, no. <laughs> I feel like that's going to be my, it's going to be my coffin nail in, in my, in my YouTube life. Everybody's like, is anything worth it? Nothing's worth nothing. No, it's, um, it's a lot of money. Uh, that was gear math. So, you know, that's where that amp came from. As you guys know, I love the 65 Deluxe. If I like the 65 Deluxe, boy, will I love the 64 hand wired. That is not true. My 65 Deluxe Reverb that I have, that you hear in every video, or not every video, but most of my videos, I think I've told you this, but I'll tell you again, I bought for $350 <laughs> used. That's what I paid for it. You can't get that deal anymore. That was a great deal then. At, when I bought it for $650, or sorry, $350, I bought it for $350. Bucks. When I bought that for $350 um, with an actual UK made greenback selection in it, which I took out and put the st the stock Jensen in it. I bought a stock Jensen and put it in there and took that out and put that in another cabinet of mine. Um, I paid 350 for it. At that time, they were probably floating between 550 to 650 used, right? If you could get 650, you're, you're, you're killing it. But 550 is about used on those at that time. And I think nine, $1,000 new was the price when I bought mine. Um, that... <laughs> So I like the 65, me personally, more than the 64. It's a little warmer. It's a little more muffled. That's the problem. It's the 64 has the clarity. So when somebody says, oh, it has the top end sparkle, it, here, here's the kick. The 64 versus 65, what it reminds me of, and this happens a lot, is the difference between professional product and not hobbyist, but, you know, uh, I'm trying to put it in a word that makes a lot of sense in a phrase the 65 deluxe sounds fuller and better in the room with me i love it more than 64 but you could tell without a doubt i've never tried it but i don't even have to i really know this if i took the 64 and a 65 on stage and with a band the 64 would cut like a you know ginsu knife through the band it would just be it just it does that and so i think if you were a legitimate gigging musician you know what i mean and you're on stage with 64, I think they, there's no musician that I can think of in the scenario that I've, 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 I've been playing these two that would pick the 65 over the 64. Now, as a mostly at-home player uh, playing you know, with friends and stuff, the 65, I think, sounds better because it sounds warmer to me and it sounds a little fuller sounding, um, and I like it. So to answer your question, um, is it worth the price? Look, man, you got to have the $2,500 for the 64, which is nuts. Um, that was, I had an opportunity to get one. I got one and it's like my Plexi. I have a Plexi, uh, eight, 1987, same thing. It's a crazy price, uh, amp. I got a situation where I, you know, lined up to get one and, um, and, uh, you know, I wanted to try it to see what I was missing. And in both cases, I could tell anybody any, the, without any doubt in this, uh, they are not my favorite amps. They would not be my last amps I ever owned. Uh, they would probably be the first to go. <laughs> <laughs> right? Like if I got a flat tire next week and need a money, my hand wired 64 or my Plexi is the first thing I'm selling because it's got value and I don't play them that much because they're nice, but they're more of a, you know, I want, you know, I want to get it out of my system and try it. Uh, Dragonstorm81 says, Hey Phil, I'm about halfway through my very first full refret. Congratulations. Uh, any tips for leveling and dealing with fret ends? I've got 
I've got the frets cut down and glued in. I'm just curious what the next step is. So the next step is obviously if your frets are in and now you got to level them, that's easy enough. Um, yes, here's the only tip I got for you. Go slow. <laughs> I don't mean physically slow, <laughs> right? Take your time. Okay. So don't worry about it. Right. Um, I know that sounds like an obvious thing to say, but, um, you know, just take your time and, and just remember, you can't put material back. You can always, you know, that's just how it works. So just go slow. You'll be fine. Uh, I always feel like that advice doesn't seem like powerful enough. Like I should have some kind of cool, you know, amazing thing to say, but it's just the reminder that you just need to, you know, take your time and you'll be fine. Okay. Um, HR says, uh, saying thanks for all your great work has helped so much with my mental health struggling over the past year. Yeah, I, I, I relate. It's been, it's been, I'm glad to hear that. Thank you. That that's probably the best compliment I could ever get. Uh, yes, everyone's had mental health issues. I think that's, it's again, I don't want to take this too far off the guitar train, uh, you know, track that we're on, but yeah, it'd be stupid to not talk about the fact musicians more so as musicians, just, I think, you know, the beat down from not seeing live music, the beat down from, uh, the disconnect, you know what I mean? From the things we love. It's been tough. It's been tough for everybody. And, uh, and not only do I thank you for the compliment, cause like, it means a lot. I also thank you for the courage to say things like that. I don't think you should bum us out when we all say like that. I think we should find strength in the commonality that we're all kind of, you know, look, it, it's just, just real. You know what I mean? I think it's just real to say that, you know, it's been tough. I've had trouble this year making content because of the, the reason you go to make the content. I've talked to a ton of YouTube channels too, by the way, not all of them, but a bunch that have all said the same thing to me personally on the phone where I go to make a video. And that's why you keep hearing me say I made a video and I'm redoing a video. It's cause you know, it's sometimes it's hard to be like, Hey guys, check this out. When you're thinking, you know, what next killer African bees of death and wood lumbers three times the price and everything. Right. It's like, you know, it, it bogs you down when you're trying to be happy or not happy, but you're trying to make people happy. You know, you first to, to make somebody happy, you have to be happy, <laughs> right? To make somebody excited, you have to be excited. It's hard to inject that. And, uh, so yeah, I understand where you're coming from and I appreciate you saying it because it's important. It's important. But the, the great thing is, um, you know, think of the blessings we all have. We all have music. We all have instruments, you know, uh, one thing I like to point out as a positive is there's a lot of people out there. And I mean a lot in this world because of the situation that's been going on for the last year that have been looking for a great hobby. That's why so many hobbies are booming. That's why guitar boomed. That's our boom. People are like, Oh crap. I don't know what to do with myself. I'm depressed or I'm sad or things are going crazy. Let me find something to do with my mind, which is a smart move. But a lot of us, we already had that going in and not all of us. Some of us like you are new and you started up and, but we all had that and I'm, I'm grateful for that. Um, so we're going to go to the next one. Next one is Joey. Joey says your videos have helped me fix an old guitar and I've been, uh, Oh, what does it say? He says, Oh, your videos, uh, have been very helpful and many things about, wait, your videos have helped me fix an old guitar and I have, and have been very helpful in many things about guitars. I just got a court G 250 FR and I love it. Check that out. I will, I will do that. The court guys were pretty cool. They sent me two guitars. They're pretty straightforward. They send me the guitars, they get, they get them back, but man, it's, it's cool guitars. Obviously I like them. So yeah, I will, I will do that. I have not reached out to court to do a review. Every guitar I've done, they've, they've sent me an email and said, you know, are you interested in doing this? But maybe I need to approach them. Disturbing the Peace Music says, just because, cheers. Thank you, man. I appreciate that. And then uh, the last two, oh, well, yeah, we're getting the last one. Uh, TT says, please explain how the built-in power attenuators with set wattages work uh, in amps like Boss and Fender uh, SS or h and Cube 2, Hughes and Kittner Tube. I'm sorry, I'm just trying to disseminate this. Um, why don't all amps use it? Um well, it's a feature. So it's a feature. And it, obviously it's not the cheapest thing to stick in an amp. There's a ton of reasons why they would want to use it. And not everybody wants it. And not every amp needs it. Some amps just, some amps do it because, well, personally, I think a lot of times it sounds crappy. 
<laughs> so that's part of it. It's, to me, like, let's use the Eddie Van Halen 5150 amps, a good example. The combos have this attenuation taken at one watt. I think that's pretty cool, but let's look at the heads. I don't really need an attenuator on the EVH head because the master on that, the distortion gets so distorted that I'm never going to turn the gain all the way up. And the master, because it has a master volume, I can turn it down. So I can get a good quiet sound on that. My Archon's a good example of that. I have no reason to attenuate that amp. I can get great sounds, just bedroom quiet. So I don't need that. So a lot of amps aren't going to need it. So they're going to put it in there and they're definitely not going to add a feature that people really don't need if it costs money because those, those features are pricey. Uh, to do. Um, so that's why they do it. And some, and some amps, like you were saying, I think what you're saying is like Boss and Fender SS solid state amps. Some solid state amps add that, but it's a simulation feature, especially in the digital amps. Like I said, that Tone Master Fender digital amp has an attenuator in the back, but even through Fender explaining it, I watched the video, they said it's kind of fake. In other words, it's simulating the attenuation, which is my understanding. Okay, so uh, Jimmy T568 says, uh, Jimmy T568 says, Highlander guitar. I do monthly class builds similar to what Texas Toast does. Okay, just don't, just not, just don't YouTube. Seems all our DIY, my class is two weeks is the class. Is, is that valuable on YouTube? Okay, again, some of these, some of these questions, I understand the question, but it's like kind of all over the place. Let me get, let me try to disseminate with again where you're going with this. So you do monthly class builds on basically on how to build guitars similar to what Texas Toast does, but you don't do them on YouTube. That I understand. It seems that all are my do-it-yourselfers, my class is two weeks. That's where I think it lost it. But I understand we type stuff and it doesn't come out the way we want, so I'll get to it. So I think what the core of your question is, should you put that stuff on YouTube? Uh, yeah, yes and no, <laughs> right? Um, it's a valuable thing to, for people if you can give information. So to answer your question is if you teach a class, a weekly you know, class on how to build guitars or how to fix things or how to do stuff, and should you put that on YouTube? Sure, of course. I think you should put that out there. But that's also with you need to also be aware that you have to make sure that your information is good, that you're presenting it well. I mean, it, so but yeah, you should do it, but you have to be aware. You just, just not just do it. I know you know this stuff. I'm just being sure we're we're clear on the same page um, because here's why, you know, years ago when people were like, what do you think, Phil, should I do it? And I, and I just went like, yeah, throw it out there. Why not throw everything out there? But what I've learned is that the internet is, is, is as kind as, is at is, is it as mean is it's, it's as mean as it is kind and make that and vice versa, which means you have to be prepared for both sides. So you want to put out the best thing you can, because even when you do your best, it's going to get, you know, a little bloody out there uh, in the comment sections. But you want to you want to be uh, the best in your own self. You want to feel like you're doing the best because those comments don't they kind of bounce off a little bit that way when you're when you're putting it out there. So my suggestion is you should film yourself, do it, maybe not put it out public yet, and just work your way up. You know what I mean? Uh, and that's assuming because I don't know you know anything else you've done. But yeah, definitely put it out there. Why not? Jeff Harper says new guitar day. Thanks for the advice on the lag. My T eighty C D showed up. You know what's funny is I saw you before the I saw your comment before the video started, the live show started, and you said it was coming. So obviously. While you were watching this, the, the driver showed up. That's awesome. Congratulations. Fox in the Hound with a W says, Hey, Phil, you see the Epiphone ghost horse? I didn't, question mark. Dang, good stuff. Anyway, uh, have a good Friday. I did not. It's like the Epiphone stuff I haven't seen. I see uh, teaser stuff, stuff coming out, but I haven't seen anything of their products uh, coming out. Um, like I said, I bought the Muse. I, I do plan to do it, but it's just it's at, at the end of the row of guitars I'm, I'm getting through right now. Um, you know, just because I can't buy all the Epiphones. <laughs> uh, James Anderson said uh, nothing. He just wanted to end the, the Super Chats and in the in the show that way. I appreciate that for supporting the show. I thank you guys for hanging out so long. It was two and a three, it was five hours long. <laughs> It was a five hour long show. Um, as always, I want to, he has uh, a couple things. Car, karma, Cham, karma, Ch, karma, champs kitten says, can't let the trolls, uh, bring you down. What I've learned. And then this is why I just want to hit this before we uh, will end on this note. What I've learned with the trolls is, or the comments is, is that you will only get upset about the things you're already upset about. 
So if you think you did something like maybe you could have done better in the video and somebody hammers you for it, it will feel more personal, not because you're mad at the person for doing it, but because you're like, yeah, I knew that too. That's what my basically advice was to go is you always want to do your best because uh, when people critique you, you know, you know when you did your best. And then when people critique you and uh, even fairly or unfairly, it will bother you if you knew, you know, you knew you put out subpar stuff. Um. And then Ed, uh, then just, just kind of summing up a couple things. Ed said, uh, what did he say? He said, do you still have your Marshall Studio JCM 800? I do not. So I got the studio, JC, I got the, well, remember, I got the Silver Jubilee Studio. Then I got the JCM 800 and I decided I liked the Silver Jubilee better. I sold the JCM 800 uh, Studio 20. And then I sold the Silver Jubilee and I went back to my 2061, which is the amp I had originally before those. And that's what I decided. I like the 2061. Now, that being said, I never tried the 20 watt plexi head. I never got my hands on one. I never got to try one. And after I bought the other two studios, really basically it's what it was. After I bought two, one, you know, whatever, $1,500, $1,200, whatever those damn Marshalls were. After I bought those two and I liked them, but didn't love them. I didn't keep them. I wasn't in the mood to buy another one. So I bought the thing I already knew I liked, the 2061, which is a great amp, but man, it, it it's no longer made. So of course the price has gotten stupid on it. Okay, on that note, I appreciate you guys all for hanging out to the end. I w and uh, I will see you guys next week. Um, I will put a notice out. Uh, I'm doing a cool video next week, too, that I'm also going to share with you guys. And uh, we have a lot of stuff to talk about next week already, which is cool. So we'll share that. As always, I want to thank you guys so much for hanging out with me today. Have you guys a great weekend and know your gear. I have to shut this off. <laughs> Bye.